Um, welcome everyone. Um, this, as as commissioners can tell from getting a 510 page um, agenda packet, um, this is a very full meeting. It is also a critically important meeting. For months now in several meetings we've been talking about or knowing that the budget is coming and knowing all the the work that the staff has been doing on it and um, understanding the direction from the governor and the and the difficulty therefore of putting together a budget. Um, so I expect a lot of the discussion in this meeting will be about that. We'll also have I know a lot of discussion of the strategic plan which we've been working on all year um, and um, we now are seeing the first real draft of that. So that's very exciting to us. Um, and there are other things about college affordability and a lot of our favorite subjects. I'm not going to, it's such a full agenda, I'm not going to take the time to talk about any of those now, except to say it may cause us to move the agenda around. We might speed through a few items. Um, we will definitely um, hope and expect that our presenters will be cognizant of the length of our agenda today. Um, so we're just going to manage it on the fly as we can and as we need to, and I know you'll understand. So thank you very much for being here. It is a critical meeting. Um, for people, um, commissioners, stay on your camera as much as you can. I know there are times when you can't be, and everyone else, this is just a reminder that in order to keep track of the commissioners and know where the conversation is going when trying to manage this remotely. If you are not presenting, please um, stay off of your camera. So I appreciate that. And it appears, oh, um, also, um, Jennifer Smith is here. Yay, this is her first official meeting. She was with us um, last month or, wait, no, we didn't have a meeting last month. She was um, with us in June. Um, sitting in so she's she's already had her intro and we welcome you we're very glad to have you as part of the commission so thank you anything you'd like to say jennifer thank you it was a uh, really interesting to attend the uh preliminary session in june and i am just constantly amazed at the uh, breadth of responsibility and uh, work plan that this commission has and um, you know, this being my first uh, voting session is kind of a doozy. Um, I've tried to prep <laughs> myself as much as I can by going through all the materials, but there's a lot of background that I'm going to look forward to hearing more about as we move through the agenda. And thank you, Sandy, for the introduction. Um, no problem at all. And, you know, everyone's here to answer questions, so don't hesitate to ask. It is there. This is called jumping in the deep end. So thank you for being here. Um, Guthrie, it looks like we have a quorum now. Can you um, call the roll, please? It does indeed. Madam Chair, Vice Chair, members of the Commission, thank you so much. I will now call roll. Sandy Rowe. Present. Greg Heyman. Present. Rukaya Adams. Present. Natalie Arnott. Uh, Rachel Bisco. Richard Devlin. I believe I saw Commissioner Devlin come online. Uh, Commissioner Devlin? Um, Arnel Fajardo? Evelyn Coker? Present. Teresa Martinez? Present. Jen Proctor Andrews? Fernando Rojas Galvan? Present. Emily Simnet? Present. Motu Thomas Apelli. Present. Gail Yamasaki. Present. Thank you, Madam Chair. That is roll with the quorum. Thank you very much. Um, okay, the oh, I would um well, let's go to let's do the um minutes. Has everyone read the minutes? Anyone have any questions? If not, can we have a motion to approve? I'll move to approve. Thanks. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Minutes are approved. 
Um, ben, I think you are up next with the executive director's report. Yeah, thanks. Good morning, commissioners. Thanks, Chair Rowe. Um, I'll be brief um, in the interest of time this morning. A few items. First, just to note um, in your agenda, as it indicates that I will present a monthly budget update. That is typical for this report, but it's not occurring this month. Ordinarily in your packets, you get that budget tracker. Um, this is a month where um, we're still putting that together, so um, we'll have that ready to go again for October. But um, as far as I can tell and I'm aware, uh, we are on track in spending against our current 2023-25 budget. All right, um, I have been providing um, in these reports uh, regular updates on Oregonians' progress in completing FAFSA or ORSAs in order to access federal and state financial aid. Um, as you know, it's been a challenging FAFSA season across the country due to the conversion by the feds to a new system that got started quite late. Um, I'm really pleased to report that um, we have almost caught up um, overall as a state with the numbers that had completed FAFSAs at this point last year. So among high school seniors, we're down about 1.7%. If you recall from prior reports in the spring, that's a gap that started at nearly uh, 20%, I think, when we were first reporting it. And it's subsequently um, come almost all the way back to where we were uh, last year at this time. We're actually ahead of where we were two years ago um, at this time. So that's uh, good news and reflects a lot of really hard work by um, folks in high schools, uh, folks in community organizations, our own staff at our Office of Student Access and Completion, and uh, work through the Aspire program and other connections with high schools and high school students. Um, overall, um, FAFSA numbers, because of course this is an application that students, returning students or adult students, not just recent you know, high school graduates, uh, have to complete in order to access aid. Overall, we're down about 3.8% in those total numbers. Um, but again, it's a 5.1% increase over 2022 at this time. So, you know, in spite of the system challenges this year, we're um, in somewhat better shape than we were two years ago. And we're drawing pretty close to where we were last year. So um, there was a lot of concern. I think still is concern about enrollment numbers this fall. But at the so our earliest indicator, which comes through those financial aid applications, would suggest that we are um, on track overall to at least get close or or equal um, our uh, enrollment from last year. Uh, just a few other items of note. It's been a been a couple of months. I want to um, call out a couple of other events and and activities uh, by the agency and agency staff. Uh, the Future Ready Oregon program, you know, it's it's been such a large and important new initiative that the HEC has had a had a big part in administering, and we've made dozens and dozens of grants to education and training institutions and community organizations to support workforce uh, development, uh, workforce training um, in the state. And one that um, is particularly um, exciting and interesting to me as a, a grant that we've made um, to expand Workforce Oregon. These are job centers that um, exist throughout the state. Expand those services into uh, Oregon correctional institutions to connect adults in custody with jobs and job opportunities uh, before their release, but pending their release. And so that's just one of a number of strategies that we're using through uh, Future Ready Oregon and the deployment of those dollars to connect Oregonians with um, training, education and training pathways to jobs um, in uh, in Oregon and uh, really will be pleased to see the, the results of that um, particular grant among many, many others. Um, I mentioned events, uh, a, a number of HEC staff, probably I think between eight and 10 HEC staff are this week in Washington, D.C. for really the premier national convening for state and system level policymakers in higher education. It's the SHEO Policy Conference, the State Higher Education Executive Officers Policy Conference. Um, they're joining over 500 folks from similar offices around the country. Um, Jim Pinkard, who you know as our Director of Post-Secondary Finance and Capital, is leading a couple of panel sessions, one on uh, funding formulas and how to review those of longer time commissioners will know that we've gone through a review cycle with the public university formula. Um, and he is among you know a handful of national experts in best practices for formula review. And so he's participating on a panel related to that topic. He's also 
um, helping lead a panel that is discussing financial challenges facing regional public institutions in higher education. And so we'll be uh, talking about some of our work and um, uh, that, sort of that landscape um, in, uh, in Oregon. That policy conference, which is held annually, falls on the heels of the SHIO annual meeting that I attend along with the executives from um, the many of the other 50 states. This was last month also in DC. It follows a similar um, agenda and I uh, moderated a panel there on financial monitoring of public institute, public and private institutions of higher education. So just another kind of topic of um, uh, uh, you know, current interest by the commission and work by commission staff as we um, continue our monitoring and reporting on the financial conditions for public universities and develop a report for community colleges at the commission's direction. So that panel included my counterparts from Ohio and New Jersey and Massachusetts, all of whom are also um, engaged in or beginning to be engaged in um, similar work in their states. Uh, so really great learning opportunities for uh, us and our staff that we look forward to you know, bringing back to the commission and back to um, each other in the months to come. Uh, just a, a couple of other events now looking uh, forward, uh, the uh, annual Aspire, two of the largest events that the HEC convenes over the course of the year are our Aspire conference. This uh, brings folks who participate in that program, including mentors and high school staff from around the state uh, brings them together annually in a large group for a variety of sessions that's coming up october 16th and 18th and then in early november an event that i think a couple of you have attended uh, is the oregon adult basic skills um, conference that'll be november 4th and 5th and again hundreds of practitioners in the adult basic um, education arena who we convene for workshops and uh, best practice sharing etc um, and speaking of adult basic education, I wanted to note that um, HEC staff accepted a national award from the uh, a nonprofit organization called the Comprehensive Adult Student Assessment Systems for our partnership during the pandemic with Southwestern Oregon Community College to create an online assessment hub and keep that adult basic education work going. And for those who are newer to the commission or newer to this concept, again, adult basic education is a really important um, component of the education and training system for adult Oregonians because it serves those who uh, may not have received a high school diploma. They may be um, immigrants from other countries. They may be uh, longtime Oregonians who didn't complete high school or a GED, but we're providing supports typically through community colleges to connect those Oregonians with education that can lead to high school diploma and college. Um, and uh, our work during the pandemic to sustain that system through this online assessment hub has been nationally recognized, adopted by other states, and there's some really great staff in the HEC Office of Community Colleges and Workforce Development that's uh, largely responsible for that in partnership, again, with Southwestern Oregon. So um, I could go on and on, you know, it's a sort of tip of the iceberg on some of the recent HEC activity, but um, looking forward to the very substantive items and discussion that we'll have over the course of the meeting to get today. Thanks, commissioners, for your service and attendance. It's a long agenda, a long day online, um, but I think it will be uh, really rewarding to um, participate in these conversations. With that, Madam Chair, back to you. Thank you, Ben. Any questions for Ben? Okay. Uh, Madam Chair? Um, yes, Commissioner Devlin. Madam Chair, I'm just checking that you can actually hear me. I have actually been online since 855, <laughs> but uh, I have had technical problems, so I was just connected completely in the last uh, two minutes. <laughs> very, very glad to have you here and to be able to see you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to public testimony now. Um, I understand from Guthrie there's quite a bit of it. Um, people who are speaking, we welcome you. We're glad to have you here. In case you're not familiar with it, we have a three-minute time limit, um, and Guthrie will he has the list, I don't, so he will both introduce you and your organization, and um, he will say three minutes when the three-minute clock has, and you don't want to wait another 15 seconds because that's about the point where I'll say thank you very much for coming. So go ahead, Guthrie. Thank you, thank you Madam Chair, and I'll just uh, remind the testifiers again to please keep your cameras off unless you're uh, currently testifying. 
and to just notify me in the chat um, if you can't access video and mic because that means I need to promote you. Uh, first off will be Suzanne Cais uh, with the Oregon Educational Association and apologies for any um, mispronunciation of names. Well, good morning. Is good morning. Um, so my name is Susan Case, and I'm an adjunct faculty member in the English to Speakers of Other Languages Department uh, at Clackamas Community College. And I'm here today to ask you to reconsider the higher education budget. While I understand and support the governor's emphasis on housing, behavioral health, and K-12 education, it fails to see that higher education is at the crux of all of these issues. We've been underfunding higher education for decades, creating instability for faculty, staff, and students. And actually, I was discussing this issue last week uh, with a colleague while we were walking to our cars, and she stopped talking and pointed to a person um, sitting on the grass and said, he was my student. And while he was my student, he lived in his car and sometimes in a tent in a remote part of campus at, at Clackamas, you can do that. Um, he was able to get a job after he graduated and now he's a classified employee and his educational experience rescued him from homelessness. In Clackamas County, there are many jobs going unf unfilled in target sector industries because of the lack of skilled and trained workers to take them. Focusing on behavioral health requires more healthcare workers and we already know that we're in deep need of more K-12 teachers. But a 1% increase in the budget for higher education doesn't even keep up um, with inflation. And this means that there will be a cut in programs, classes, and services needed to train those future teachers and healthcare workers just when they'll be needed most. In my program, um, the ESOL department, we've seen a 62% increase in the demand for seats in our program since the pandemic. We are at capacity. And that means that right now, new students are waiting between two and three terms, or six to nine months, um, for the opportunity to enroll in English classes. And this means we aren't able to capitalize on the knowledge and skills of the people already in our communities. In my courses, I've had and have currently computer science experts from Ukraine, architects, people with business degrees from Mexico, nurses from Mexico, Russia, and Ukraine, doctors from Venezuela, physicists from Russia, and even a professional baseball player from Cuba. This doesn't even count the people who arrive with one or two or three years of college already under their belts. A 1% increase isn't gonna get us the faculty that we need to tackle our wait lists. In Clackamas County alone, more than 15,000 people don't speak English as well as they'd like. So the demand for services isn't likely to drop anytime soon. An increase in investment ensures that we have the next generation of K-12 teachers and behavioral health specialists that we need to achieve the governor's goals. In this time of high inflation, we are all suffering, but a de facto cut in funding will prevent all of us from experiencing um, a future full of promise, like that experienced by the student who lived in his car because he valued his education above all else. As Tim Cook, CCC's president, once told us, more than 50% of our students are one flat tire away from homelessness. The failure to increase the budget for higher education puts even more of the cost of education onto the backs of students. And sadly, that's likely to mean more homeless students. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for coming. Next up, uh, Joseph Bartholomews. Hello, uh, my name is Joseph Bartholomews and I am a student at Oregon State University. I worked through high school and through the pandemic and I'm working through college to be able to afford my education. Despite working full-time hours in the summer and part-time while attending school, I have still needed to take out loans to afford my educational expenses and without financial aid, I would not be able to attend a university at all. My mother, who was until very recently not financially stable in the slightest, was unable to save for my education, let alone that of my four siblings, and has made it clear that I am responsible for my own expenses. Because of this, I've done my best to minimize my expenses to get through college. I was accepted to multiple universities across the state, including private schools like Willamette University, but I've had to turn them down after realizing how much they would cost. I decided to attend Oregon State University because it was the most affordable option and because it was close to home, ensuring that I had a stable support system nearby for my education. 
I do not live on campus because it is more expensive than living off of it, and I walk to school to avoid gas costs, meaning that I walk a few miles daily to get to and from school. I'm not alone in this by any stretch. My job at the university is to assist students at our billing office, and I have seen firsthand how the high tuition rates at our public universities can present a substantial burden for students' educations. I have listened to people burst into tears over the phone asking how they could possibly cover their tuition expenses. For people who lack the financial aid that I have, the cost of tuition, even for in-state students, is simply impossible to pay. I know for a fact that it, it has not always been this way. Part of my job at the billing office is to inform people of our tuition rates, and I have seen, using our historic tuition tables, how much the cost of tuition for in-state students has ballooned. When I was born in 2004, a single year at OSU cost $4,869 for in-state students. Next year, I can expect to pay $14,400, and that is as a student who has already attended two years at OSU. For new students, the cost is even higher. Students like me rely on our public universities. Without public universities, I probably wouldn't be able to have higher education or a four-year degree. If the state does not fund its schools properly and continues to deny key funding requests by our schools, I can expect that a student in my position will not be able to get a university education in 10 or 20 years. This is not acceptable in the modern world where many careers are locked behind a four-year diploma. I, employ, I implore members of the Higher Education Coordination Commission to do what is right for the students of Oregon and to give the universities the funding they need. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, next up would be Ted Cooper. Um, however, I do not see them in the chat, so we will uh, go on to Dana Richardson and come back. Good morning. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Rowe and commissioners. For the record, my name is Dana Richardson. I'm the executive director of the Oregon Council of Presidents, a voluntary association of Oregon's public university presidents. Affordability and access. Rarely does this commission meet and not discuss and promote college affordability and access. Research presented to this commission shows that state investments correlate to reduce stu student borrowing and increase the likelihood that students will earn the degree that they are seeking. And the most successful programs pair those two, academic support and increased financial aid. Unfortunately, today the commission is poised to recommend budgets for the public universities and community colleges that are nearly $100 million less than the minimum amount needed to continue current programs and services for students. That recommendation will be coupled with one for a small investment in the Oregon Opportunity Grant that we know won't nearly meet the needs of the students. As you consider this budget, please know it is not possible to increase affordability with a budget that doesn't keep up with costs to do what we're currently doing. It's terribly unfortunate that we have arrived at a place where Oregonians and their leaders simply accept that families and students should pay to cover the cost of post-secondary education that the state has chosen not to support. The public universities want to partner with you and thank you for the statement that you're putting forward today to make the case for the transformative power of higher education and reverse Oregon's trend of relying on students and their families to pick up more than their fair share of the costs. Thank you for your efforts today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dana. Thank you. Next up, Tiana uh, Gilliland, uh, Associated Students of Southern Oregon University. Welcome, Tiana. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Tiana Gilliland, and I'm the student body president at Southern Oregon University. It is my honor to be here representing more than 5,000 students attending SOU, where we work together um, with administration, faculty, and staff to build the university of the future. My fellow public university student body presidents and I are concerned and have signed a letter no uh, noting how insufficient the proposed budget is when it comes to students who want to take the education beyond high school. I do want to share that the budget as proposed sends a clear message that the state of Oregon is ambulant at best when it comes to supporting a student's path to future economic success through higher education. While we do have the Oregon Promise, which offers many Oregon students the opportunity to have free community college, and yes, it is true that Oregon has invested $100 million more in 2023 to support public universities, 
Other states, however, have invested far more in public universities to help the recovery from the pandemic and to diversify their economies. The level of funding provided by the state of Oregon has been less than other surrounding states and it has real impact on Oregon students. To balance university budgets, they've had to increase tuition to make up for what the legislative won't fund. And that makes it much harder for me and students like myself to attend a four-year university to complete a bachelor's degree and have the advantage in life that a college degree offers. While the state of Oregon may be wavering on the value of a four-year degree, I am not and my fellow students at SOU do not. We work full and part-time jobs to be able to afford a college degree and we have to take out loans to achieve our educational goals. It is not healthy for students to have to do this with the burden and could be reduced. University has had a much harder time providing needed support and, and students on the path realizing their educational aspirations when there's not adequate funding. The issue for us students is not whether four year universities worth the value. It's whether we can make it work and whether the universities can make things work on reduced budgets. Our regional universities are strapped and they've been reporting requir more reporting requirements than ever before. They are supporting students who have gone through COVID for reduced learning time and trying to help them build skills in the past um, would have been developed in high school. The budget before you today will not help students and will not help universities realize their potential. It is not even a current service level budget. It is a cuts budget, which calls into question whether Oregon supports a prosperous future for all. I know you all have instructions on how much you can request the governor fund, but those instructions don't help students like myself and many other students who rely on this funding to be able to attend university. I hope you're willing to make a bold statement today around the insufficiency of the requested budget for Oregon students and Oregon's future. Oregon is ranked 44th right now in per pupil funding of the public universities. We may move up the ranking some this year, but getting closer to an average should not be the focus of this committee or the legislative. If the state of Oregon cares about building the innovation and leadership of the future, cares about keeping Oregon students in state after higher high school graduation, and cares about building a workforce to drive economic growth, it should do better and needs to be do better. Thank you for listening. Thank you for coming and testifying. Uh, next up, Katie Quick with um, PSU Advocates. Hello, Chair Rowe and fellow members of the committee. Uh, my name is Katie Quick and I'm an alumna of Portland State University. Um, I currently serve as the co-chair for the PSU Advocates Committee, which is a group of concerned alumni, donors, faculty, and staff who advocate for more resources to ensure that all Oregonians have access to equitable and affordable education. Recently, I learned that the Higher Education Coordinating Commission is set to adopt a budget that would result in a significant gap in operating costs for public universities. As you may know, Oregon ranks 44th nationally for per student funding and uh, public higher education. This budget would only exacerbate the challenges that students are already facing, increasing the risk of dropouts due to rising education costs. While I recognize that the state has increased investment over recent years, the proposed budget does not keep up with the current service levels necessary to provide students with the wraparound services that they need, especially as universities continue to adapt to post-pandemic needs of students today. It is evident that these much needed resources are effective as we have seen a significant increase in graduation rates in recent years. I personally chose Portland State 14 years ago because it was the most accessible and affordable public university at the time. I've greatly benefited from PSU's vast resources and community with its unique placement in downtown Portland. I was able to stay close to home and benefit from the uh, city university. But 14 years later, I'm still paying off my student loans. <laughs> and thankfully, I'm in a well established, I'm well established in my career to be able to do so. Um, and at this time, when inflation and high rent prices are burdening current and potential students, it's even more difficult to commit to paying for a college education. Every dollar that we invest into our Oregon universities gives back exponentially with an educated and connected workforce. Those students tend to stay in Oregon after graduation and they boost our local economies. We cannot continue shifting the cost of attending college onto, the, onto today's students and their families. Many lower and middle class families take out loans and graduate with debt. It's imperative that we keep Oregon public higher education students, uh, that we help them to cross the finish line and prepare them for today's workforce. So I urge you to reconsider the proposed budget to ensure that every student in Oregon has access to high quality, affordable higher education and wraparound services. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. 
Uh, next, we have Isaac uh, Insko, Associated Students of Eastern Oregon University. Sorry. Um, hello, uh, Chair Rowe, Vice Chair Ham Hammond, Director Cannon, and members of the Commission. For the record, my name is Isaac Insko, and I serve as the President of the Associated Students of Eastern Oregon University, Oregon's Rural University. I'm here today, along with several of my fellow student leaders, to bring our voices to the table and to share with you about how critically important it is that we find a way to increase the agency recommended budget. To be honest, the proposed budget means many of my fellow students will not be able to attend college. Our universities have requested $275 million more in funding from the last biennium. This is just to cover costs and continue offering ex existing services to students. To make our state better and to give students an opportunity to better their own lives, we need this investment. Like most of my friends, I am working this summer to help pay for college. I actually stopped driving my tractor this morning to come and meet with you all. I know the cost of attending college and how it is a struggle for all of us to afford it. I'm often asked why I don't just get a full-time job on the farm. Why even go to college? For myself and my fellow students, we know that an education means opportunity for us now and in the future. But those questions are never harder to answer or have never been harder to answer when more and more of the costs are shifted onto students. We are the ones expected to pick up the tab when the state is limiting the Oregon Opportunity Grants for financial aid and the reducing funding for our universities where we can achieve a degree that helps us reinvest in the state and our communities. As we shared in our letter, Oregon is already far behind other states in supporting public higher education and huge returns on that investment. Together, we ask you to please support Oregon students and consider adjusting the ARB to meet the needs of its students. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Going back in the list to Ted Cooper with American Federation of Teachers, Oregon. And Ted, you've just been promoted, so should be able to enable camera and mic. Hello, my name is Ted Cooper. I'm a PhD candidate in computer science at Portland State University, and I teach there. I am also the executive vice president of AFT Oregon. Last year, we saw more than 70 part-time faculty lose their jobs at PSU. We don't know that number yet for this year, but many have reached out to us because they have been told that they do not have a guarantee of continuing employment. There have also been cuts in full-time faculty, academic professionals, and staff. In 2018, there were more than 800 graduate employees at PSU. Now there are fewer than 400. That means more than 400 fewer graduate students able to leverage a job at PSU to complete their degree with a tuition waiver. We have seen our institution and community diminished year after year and watched our students suffer under more and more untenable debt. Recently, PSU cut the intensive English language program. This deeply impacts students learning English as a second language and limits their ability to succeed and thrive at PSU. PSU is also in the process of ending its undergraduate recruitment program for international students. These efforts combined may reduce the cultural diversity, which makes our urban campus a uniquely impactful learning environment. The 1% annual budget increase proposed would continue and accelerate these trends. We see more of the same across Oregon's other public universities and community colleges. In particular, the technical and regional universities already in a vulnerable position would be harmed. This budget amounts to a continuing disinvestment in public higher education in Oregon to the detriment of our students, our employees, and our state. I urge you to reconsider this decision. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for coming, Ted. Next, uh, Axel Cervantes Pineda, student, uh, Portland Community College. Can you guys hear me all right? Mm -hmm. You're right. good. Hello, Cheryl and members of the Oregon Higher Education Coordinating Commission. My name is Axel Cervantes Pineda, and I am a student at Portland Community College. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today about the proposed recommended budget for the 2025 through 2027 Community College Support Fund. 
As a community college student, I can tell you that this proposed budget increase is just not enough. Community college community colleges are vital for students like me who rely on them for affordable and accessible education. They help us get the skills we need to enter the workforce or to transfer to four-year universities. For students like me, this proposed budget means higher tuition and fewer services that we depend on. The proposed budget accepts that students and families should cover the costs and that the state isn't willing to support, which unfairly affects lower and middle income students. I chose Portland Community College because of its accessibility and affordability. I aspire to make a change in the social aspect of our world and pursue a degree in public health. In order to achieve this, higher education is greatly recommended. Being from a culture where education is not prominent, I had little to no support from those around me. If it wasn't for the support I had received from resources such as Future Connect, College Housing Northwest, the Women's Resource Center, and the Queer and Dream Resources Centers here at PCC, it's very possible I will not be on the path I am today. The centers and student supports not only help students succeed with our education, but also help us succeed at life. I believe if you can succeed in both of these areas, then you can succeed anywhere. And this is exactly the support I have received from the resources at PCC. Without proper funding, these programs are at risk, and that affects our ability to succeed and contribute to Oregon's workforce. It's not just about tuition. Many students rely on services like affordable housing, childcare, and help with food and transportation. These services are crucial, especially for students from low income, backgrounds, or historically underrepresented groups. As you prepare to finalize the budget, I urge you to consider how important it is to adequately invest in Oregon's higher education institutions. Community colleges need the support to continue providing quality education and services that students like me rely on. Thank you for listening to my perspective, and I hope you take these concerns into account when making your decision. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have a submission of written testimony from Joshua Hutchinson, a student at uh, Portland Community College. Uh, this testimony is included as 3.0A, written testimony, Joshua Hutchinson, and is a letter addressed to the commission touching on topics of uh, increased uh, support funding to meet student basic needs as well as the Oregon Opportunity Grant. Our next verbal testimony uh, is from Kakachi Akpaku uh, with the Associated Students of University of Oregon. Um, I have not seen them join yet, so I will keep an eye out as we move to Ravi uh, Kulap with the Associated Students of University of Oregon. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yes. OK, uh, my name is Ravi. I go to the University of Oregon. Uh, I worked at the student advocacy program for two years, and my primary role was helping students navigate university processes, such as student conduct cases and appeals. But more often than not, I found myself having to assist students with a myriad of basic needs issues, which are often underlying to their situations. One student I had was forced to drop out because staying in the dorms and paying out of state tuition uh, was too much for her. And she didn't have a place to live or, or a way to get back home to Texas. Uh, we worked around the clock with the basic needs program, which students at, at U of O pay a million dollars a year for to get her uh, emergency funds to get back home to Texas. Uh, even though she wasn't a student anymore, she was able to return home. The students I've had with these kinds of cases are, are usually students of color and low income students. Uh, due to privacy concerns, we don't keep data on students' cases. Otherwise, I would share that statistic with you. My main priority as a student advocate is not that we have the best graduation rate in the state or anything like that. What I care about is that students at U of O, my friends, have a place to live, food to eat, and are able to spend their time thinking about school itself, not whether they can be in school in the first place. More state funding would go a long way to ease the financial burden of higher education on students. And there's a pretty big misconception that all students at U of O have a certain degree of like privilege that they're able to afford this education. They don't, and often they're not. Some students don't eat enough or don't have stable housing or make any number of unfair sacrifices that they shouldn't have to make just so that they can pay for college since a college degree is becoming less and less optional in today's job market. The agency request budget is not enough to meet these student needs and we humbly ask that the governor request more money to be added to the public university support fund and the Oregon Opportunity Grant and her governor recommendation budget. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Uh, next up, Christian Walker uh, with Associated Students of University of Oregon. Hi, everyone. Chair, Vice Chair, Executive Director, and members of the Commission. My name is Chris Walker, and I attend the University of Oregon, where I'm the Basic Needs Director. So, for the Executive Branch of Student Government. So, how desperately do students need Oregon State funding to increase to their public universities? How about the distance of half the globe? That's how far I traveled from Oregon to go somewhere where tuition made sense. 
After graduating valedictorian from Grants Pass High School, I attended school in Amsterdam because I could afford their tuition, but I wasn't home. I should be able to live in Oregon and afford higher education. I transferred home in 2022. Here, as a bright student with plenty of merit and an Oregonian, I received no merit scholarships because I transferred. Technicality. As an Oregonian, sticker price is a lot for supposedly public universities. Being at UO and in the Honors College, it's 6000 every three months. Should I drop the Honors College? Should I drop out? Forget about my future? How am I going to up afford my upcoming senior year? These are the questions a lack of state funding is forcing on students. The lack of state funds from the taxes I and my parents have been paying for a long time is squeezing students and families and then leaving them out to dry. We need to invest in higher education as the backbone of what makes a state grow. When we fund universities, the economy blooms. This is reality. While Oregon is far behind the rest of the nation in per student funding for public universities, the agency's proposed budget would move us even further in the wrong direction. Education is the greatest investment the state can make in its future. Oregon needs to meet reality and match its peer schools in meeting the bare minimum in state funding. We can do so much better and grow more with increased funding. People are struggling with basic needs at University of Oregon, hunger and housing. We have homeless ducks. But with more state funding, we can stop raising tuition and stop squeezing students out of being able to afford rent. They could focus on better things. So I direct my passion to the governor by urging her to fully fund higher education in her budget request to the legislature. Let's do it. We're asking that the state not only close the 25 million gap that exists between the agency's proposed budget request, but make significant investments. Thank you. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you for coming. Next up, uh, Louisa Hooven. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Louisa Hooven, and I'm a research and instructor at Oregon State University. I'm also the grievance officer for my faculty union, UAOSU, and vice president for political action with AAUP Oregon. Um, as educators and union members, we believe that Oregonians deserve a public university system that provides accessible, affordable, high-quality education to any person who chooses to pursue it. However, the 1% increase to the current support level put forth by the HEC under the current recommendations of the governor will ensure that this goal cannot be met by Oregon's public universities or community colleges. Such anemic funding will only serve to exacerbate the problems faced by students, staff, and faculty at Oregon's public universities. And the brunt of this harm will be borne by our students and their families through tuition increases. According to data collected by the State Higher Education Executive Officers Association, as of 2022, Oregon was already well below the national average for funding and was last among our neighboring states in state support for higher education. Per their most recent report, the student share at Oregon's public universities is 68.2%. So for every $10 spent on a four-year degree, our state provides little more than three. In contrast, the national average is 50.2%, and the average for our neighboring states is 41.7%. Because of cratering state support and skyrocketing tuition costs, university students across the United States experience food and housing insecurity at a higher rate than the national average. Last year, the National Center for Education Statistics released the data from its 2019-20 National Post-Secondary Student Aid Study. This study found that 23% of undergraduate students and 12% of graduate students had experienced food insecurity. They also found that 8% of undergraduate students and 5% of graduate students were unhoused. In contrast, the USDA reported that 10.5% of American households experienced food insecurity in 2020, and the Department of Housing and Urban Development found that 0.17% of Americans experienced homelessness in 2019. The National Center for Educational Statistics is currently collecting data for its next report, and it is highly unlikely that the situation will have improved. 
our students can't attain their educational goals if they are experiencing food and housing insecurity and the current administration's interest in tackling the unhoused crisis afflicting Oregonians will be undermined by a 1% budgetary increase at the HEC. Such low funding will also contribute to the continued degradation of faculty and staff working conditions. Our students can't succeed if there is insufficient funding to recruit and retain the world-class faculty and staff that educate and support them through their academic careers. Our members can't help our students succeed when their wages and working conditions I, force them. I apologize, to... but that's three minutes. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Next up, we have uh, Abby Lee, Oregon Community College Association. Abby Lee. We can see you now. Good morning. Thank you morning. for that. Um, Chair Rowe, Vice Chairman Heyman, Director Cannon, and members of the HEC, it is my honor to be here with you this morning. I am Abby Lee with uh, Oregon Community College Association. And first, I want to thank you for your support and for the hard decisions that you have to make. We understand that there are competing priorities um, in the governor's office and that there is a lot to balance. But what we want to offer you today is that our community colleges stand ready to be partners in these solutions. And frankly, as you've heard, this current service level proposal does not, not only does not meet our current needs, but it will be detrimental to higher education in Oregon. And so we appreciate the opportunity to provide some additional data as you reconsider um, what that request should be. At $854 million, this will, this current proposal will result in almost $75 million cut over the next biennium for our colleges. And as you know, when our colleges and universities are not able to keep pace with the real cost increases, as we look at healthcare costs and employee costs and all of the inflationary costs to meet our, um, our mandates and our needs, this results in increased tuition or program and service costs cuts for the very students that we are all trying to serve. I'm offering some exciting news today, though, as you heard from Director Cannon, we are seeing some increases in enrollment, and we are doing the exact thing that you have helped us do over these last years is getting our um, students um, in school and back to work. Excitingly, we are seeing increases in career and technical education in the very programs that our businesses and our communities need. But as you know, these are some of the most costly programs at our colleges. And um, yet these are the programs that are essential for filling community needs and our positions, programs such as firefighters, welders, nurses, our addiction peer support services, automotive technicians, and building inspectors to meet this growing housing need in our state. The students that Oregon Community Colleges serve also have continued and growing need for wraparound services, childcare, housing, food insecurity, and so additional cuts that don't meet our basic um, funding needs limits our ability to provide these services and supports. 30 seconds, Abby. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I just finally want to let you know that we stand ready to continue to be partners to invest in solutions, and we stand ready to help our governor meet her priorities in housing and um, and our, our addiction studies and all of those additional needs. And we are grateful for the opportunity to be partners in this effort. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Jenna Taylor, student with uh, Southern Oregon University. Jenna. Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me good? Yes. Okay. My name is Jenna. I'm a digital cinema student at Southern Oregon University, and I'm testifying on behalf of Southern Oregon's Creative Industries proposal. So today I have made a video outlining my proposal to the HECC board, and I was just wondering if you have access to that video or if I should share my screen. Uh, I should be able to share it. Okay, awesome. Thank you. 
Good morning, my name is Jenna. I'm a digital cinema student at Southern Oregon University in the graduating class of 2024. I've been with SOU for two years and this program has done wonders for my career and for my life. First off, I wanted to thank the Higher Education Coordinating Committee for their work in reviewing the various project proposals from the seven public universities. I also wanted to thank the HECC for understanding the value of SOU's creative industries and the Student Success Center proposal. Creative and digital industries provide over 60,000 jobs in Oregon and add nearly $13 million each year to our regional economy, and it keeps growing. Expanding SOU's Digital Media Center would not only be a good investment to our economy, but to our future workforce. I also believe it's a critical time to support SOU, which was excitedly included in the top 30 film schools by Movie Maker Magazine this summer. With the support of the project, we can expect an increase of students from outside of Oregon who will pay a higher tuition price to attend our amazing school. This project is also expected to have a ripple effect that improves a variety of our programs, including relocating the ROTC and some athletic programs to our current DMC site. And finally, this project will enhance our community connections with a renovated music facility and get our public facilities in the building and up to ADA code. I hope this gives you an insight into a student's perspective of our SOU facilities, and I just want to thank you for your time and supporting the list of projects as developed by the HECC staff. Sweet. Uh, thank you for having me, and I appreciate your work that you've done on reviewing these proposals. Thank you, Jenna. No problem. Uh, next up, Nathan Schmidt um, with a uh, student with OSU. And um, I will just ask that if uh, Kakichi has, or uh, excuse me, um, Kikachi has joined, um, if you could just notify me in the chat. Um, yeah, I wanted to first off, thank you guys for having me today. And thank you for the HECC um, for listening to you know students around the state here. Um, I kind of just wanted to talk a little bit about my own personal experiences uh, with the cost of college and how that has um, affected you know, me and the various students I've seen. Um, and so <clears throat> in short, in college is right now just like exorbitantly expensive. Um, I have seen a lot of students um, just through my various roles within Oregon State University um, not be able to pay their tuition or have to go homeless um, or you know, trying to find other means and ways um to you know invest in themselves and invest in the state of oregon by getting a college of edu a college um education um <clears throat> you know the fact of the matter is you know I i've had to do that my myself i've always worked two jobs while attending college um in the summer uh to pay for college i'll go and work on a farm um you know and it's like 90 hours a week or something in the sun um, and the fact of the matter is, you know, even with these opportunities, a lot of students don't have access to education. And this is a, creating quite the disparity within the younger generation right now because they don't have access um, to, you know, the, the means to better themselves, right? Just because, like, right now the job market does essentially require or will require such um, a high degree of education to even get a basic starter job. Um, you're creating this gut of students who just won't be able to have access to that education. So I encourage you all to just reconsider the budget um, and maybe, you know, increase funding for education just for my fellow students. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, that brings us to the end of the signed up testimony. Okay, thank you very much, Guthrie, for managing that. Um, before we move on, I'd just like to say a few words on behalf of my fellow commissioners. And also, I know you will hear from many of them later in the meeting as we get to the budget. But um, to the students specifically, to everyone who spoke, but to the students specifically, it is so important to us to hear your real lived stories and experiences and the difficulties that the obstacles you overcome to attend college and university and that friends and people you work with on schools do. Um, many of you are very brave to come to us and to speak your truths and share with us the insight um, that you have well beyond what we can have. 
So um, for everyone who testified, it is meaningful to us. Um, I know the the budget looks like, well, gosh, heck disagrees. Um, I think you'll hear and understand that um, we all agree that colleges and universities need and deserve more funding. Um, they have, as one of you said, for decades in this state. And at heck, we are absolutely committed to trying to make that happen, not just this biennium, but every biennium, um, both through the Oregon Opportunity Grant and through direct funding to schools and through special programs. So um, what we have with this very difficult mandate we were given by the governor um, is trying to figure out if there are ways we can help her and encourage her and hope that there is revenue to increase this budget. But make no mistake, um, no one thinks it is sufficient. So I just want to thank you for coming and let you know that we are doing the best we can and we will continue to be dedicated, especially to the students um, and to the needs that you have in order to finish higher education. And I'd also like to note that there, um, I should have the statistic at hand, but I don't. In addition to full-time students, especially at the community college colleges, the largest percentage are part-time students, many of those because of affordability issues. And so it's, yes, it's higher education and certainly the four-year degree and beyond, but in Oregon, we also have great dependence on the training programs and the certificate programs that are offered at many other schools. So thank you for coming and um, I hope you will stay for the budget discussion. Okay, um, we are going to move on now to the community college and university program approvals. I'd like to remind the commissioners, well, we have 10, if I'm looking at it right, we have one approval um, that's an action item. And then following that, we have 10 um, program approvals that are consent item on the consent agenda, and then um, two BS degrees. And I want to remind commissioners that when we had a lot of questions at the last meeting about the trends of the new programs, um, we're approving that um, Donna Llewellyn responded to us and she is going to come back in October, I think, um, and have a detailed presentation so we understand better the programs that are being added and sort of how she sees them and what, what she can tell us. So Donna, welcome very much. You are now here for an action item, correct? I believe so. Um, I am before you right now to speak about the uh, just a brief overview of the community college program approval before you take on this morning's consent agenda items. Um, okay. Good morning, um, Chair Rowe, Vice Chair Heyman, and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Donna Llewelling, and I have the privilege of serving as the Director of the Office of Community Colleges and Workforce Development. During your June meeting, as you mentioned, some additional questions were raised regarding the STEM and early learning less than one year certificate of completion at Central Oregon Community or at Central Oregon Community College. I'm here this morning to provide a brief overview of the review process, which I hope will provide the additional information needed for the commission to reconsider the approval of that certificate. Guthrie, can you do me a favor? Do you have the slide deck um, uh, available that you could pull up for me? If not, I can share my screen from here. Just like that magic. Next slide, please. Thank you, Guthrie. Um, so this next slide that is in front of you right now is provides a very high level overview of the steps that are taken by staff and the processing of the applications as we get them ready for your consideration. So we, the application comes in, it comes in about six weeks ahead of when the commission sees it, um, depending on when your meeting is, et cetera. We create an approval packet internally that includes a lot of review 
review documents for our education uh, program specialists. They then review that packet and approve or send um, back to the college for more information. And then once we complete that, um, that process, your docket is created and sent to Guthrie for inclusion in your um, docket items. That's the process, but I'd like to really spend a little bit more time in the approval parameters. Next slide, please. First and foremost, the application materials must show clear need through uh, labor market information. In addition, each program or certificate that is reviewed by the Office of Community College and Workforce Development um, for CTE um, needs to meet five standards. Need, they have to provide clear evidence of the need for the program. They need to show collaboration, that they're utilizing systemic methods for meeting and ongoing involvement of appropriate partners. No silos or vacuums. Let's, let's coordinate and leverage resources. Um, alignment, how is it aligned with appropriate education, workforce development, and economic development clusters? The design, it leads to the knowledge um, and student achievement of the academic and technical knowledge, skills, and related proficiencies that are needed. And then we consider the capacity of the college, and they have to identify that they have the resources to develop, implement, and sustain the program. And then we also review any support letters that come in. Those are often um, one of the primary indicators of evidence for the support, support of labor market need. Next slide, please. This, um, this particular slide is just literally a visual um, of a high level overview of what is included in your docket item. So that program summary, and then those approval standards of that need, collaboration, alignment, design, and capacity. And then we also do require some assurances that include what, what what does access to this program look like? Are, are you committed to continuous improvement? Make sure you're not detrimentally duplicating and that what are you doing for records maintenance and those types of things? Those are those are more of the kind of paperwork sort of things, but we have to keep those on file as well. Next slide, please. This particular slide we put together for you to just show a very high level summary of the program approval in action. Um, and this is with regards to the Central Oregon um, certificate that is in question. Um, the standards and supporting documentation are detailed in your materials, but we've summarized them here. And additionally, the next slide will focus on the collaboration and supporting documentation. Next slide, please. Since your last meeting, the CCWD team has worked with Central Oregon Community College to clarify their participation and collaborations in developing the STEM and Early Learning One Year Certificate of Completion. The information here summarizes those partnerships and collaborations, and particularly the close collaboration with the Oregon Registry. I'd like to close with a quote from their partner letters or their partner support letter. We are supportive of this proposal and its aim to address rising educators sense of connection to the STEM areas and their confidence in developing, implementing and supportive STEM based activities for young children and their families. We have received the proposed set of courses that center on the underlying concepts and mindsets in the STEM areas. And we agree they provide a solid understanding of young children's learning and developmental needs and the pedagogical content knowledge and necessary to engage young children. With that, I'm happy to answer any additional questions you may have regarding this certificate. Thank you, Donna, for explaining the process questions. OK, then um, we need an uh, approval of the Central Oregon Community College STEM and Early Learning program proposal. Can I have a motion, please? Move to approve. Thank you. In a second. 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 Thank you. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Motion passes. Thank you again, Donna. Thank you. Okay. Um, now we're moving to the consent items. 
And um, Guthrie, we can do all 12 of these at the same time, or do we need to separate out the um, university ones? We can proceed with all 12 together, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's go ahead with that. We have a motion to approve the consent item agenda. Motion to oh. approve. Thank you. In a second, I think second. we've got it. Second. second there. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. The consent item agenda is approved. Okay, legislative report. I think, Ben, you're going to give a brief summary there for Kyle. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. We're, we're going to take this one very quickly, um, partly in the interest of time and partly because this uh, update has not changed much since the June report that Kyle provided. You'll see in your packets or in the materials online uh, that we uploaded yesterday um, a uh, report, item 5.0, that describes or contains the six legislative concepts that um, the HEC is currently requesting be drafted by Legislative Council. These are um, policy concepts that uh, align with the agency request budget that's before you today or don't have a budget impact um, and that are generally consistent with um, the strategic priorities of the HEC or technical issues that staff have identified and um, should be addressed. Uh, I know that we'd be happy to you know, take any questions um, now or offline about any of these concepts. The process for moving these forward to the legislature involve um, not only the, the drafting of the proposal by Legislative Council, but review by the governor uh, and the governor's staff, as well as the commission's final vote of support likely in the November uh, commission meeting before they would be um, brought forward to um, the governor for her final approval and the legislature when it convenes um, in 2025. Um, again, no, nothing new here that you haven't seen before, but um, if there are questions, we can take those. Otherwise, move um, on to our next item. Any questions for Ben on that? And just like magic, we are back on schedule. Who would have thought? <laughs> Um, okay, now we're going into the funding and the agency request budget. And Ben, you are up first. Yeah, thanks. And I'll be joined by um, Tom Reel, our Director of Operations. The, the way we thought we would uh, begin this conversation with the Commission is uh, that I will present an overview of the process and sort of what you're looking at and doing today. Tom will um, spend a few minutes describing some of the key elements of the agency request budget that's before you, some of the features that are unique or new in this agency request budget or some of the things that might um, kind of stand out to you or those who are uh, watching. And then finally, it'll come back to me. I will uh, describe the letter that the chair drafted um, uh, ensure that that is uh, brought to your attention and then really uh, open it up for discussion and, and let the chair uh, sort of navigate you all through what I hope will ultimately result in your action to approve and submit the agency request budget. Um, please do, of course, feel free to stop me or Tom in our um, introductory remarks. I don't think this will take us more than um, 10 or 15 minutes, so I really do expect that the vast majority of the time that's been set aside for this will be yours um, in discussion and conversation and questions, um, et cetera. Um, with that, let me let me begin just by very quickly sketching sort of a, an overview of the process. As commissioners likely re realize and remember, um, you began your work on this budget development cycle really early this year um, in uh, re reviewing our current budget, establishing some uh, priorities for the upcoming budget, uh, looking at uh, the various programs and policy options that staff began to prepare for your consideration and potential prioritization. The Funding and Achievement Subcommittee of this commission in particular uh, took some deep dives into budget at its April 10th, 2024 and May 8th meetings. And then in June, the full commission reviewed really a draft of staff recommendations for inclusion within your agency request budget that the materials today 
uh, mirror. So you're you're seeing uh, a, a budget proposal from staff that is almost identical to what you saw in June. Uh, big picture, just as a, a reminder, the agency request budget is the first step in a uh, multi-tiered process of developing the state budget for the biennium that will begin July 1st of 2025. And your recommendations go to the governor and help to inform her in the preparation of her governor's recommended budget. That budget has to be balanced to projected revenues, and it becomes uh, a starting point for conversation and deliberation by the legislature in 2025. By uh, June 30th of next year, we expect the roughly June 30th, we expect the legislature to adopt adopted a budget for the governor's signature, and that becomes the actual budget. So this is early days in a long development process, budget development process that have uh, in which for which many many voices have yet to be heard. Right? This 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 will become. Um, this will be very different by the time it emerges. We don't know how, but we can be certain that it will be very different by the time it is signed by the governor than what you're looking at today in your agency request budget. Nevertheless, this does um, represent a, a sort of a first step and a significant starting point in the process of establishing current service level and expressing the commission's recommendations for potential new investment or changes um, to that um, current service level budget. As you know, and as um, you heard in public testimony this morning, uh, your agency request budget this year is constrained by the governor's requirement that the HEC limit its request for new spending, which take the form of policy option packages or POPs, new spending above the current service level budget to 1% of our total budget for the current biennium, 2023-25. That's a mouthful, so let me let me attempt again, <laughs> uh, slowly to express and summarize the governor's requirement. It is that in its recommendation, in its agency request budget, the commission limit its total new requests for general fund spending above the current service level. Keeping in mind, current service level is an estimate of the ongoing costs of doing what we're doing today. And then any additional recommendations that the commission wants to make should be uh, contained within that 1% limit or about $31 million. And as we discussed in June and in prior months, that's a significant constraint on the HEC's uh, ability to request new funding, especially given the historic role that this commission has played in uh, making very ambitious requests for funding post-secondary education and training in order to meet state goals and the commission's strategic plan. So this is a different paradigm for uh, the commission's work. So what um, Tom will do uh, in is sort of walk through what the staff recommendation for that 1%, sort of a current service level plus 1% budget looks like. So you'll see, a, 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 as you did in June, a, uh, a, a representation or a summary of the staff recommendations for um, your agency request budget that meets the governor's uh, expectations and requirements on the agency and the commission. And then I'll come back and just summarize a few of the points that the chair has made in her draft letter to reflect the commission's perspective that that uh, budget is insufficient for meeting our state goals and strategic plan and priorities. So let me um, turn it over to Tom here and it may be helpful, um, Tom, if you're not prepared to, I can uh, present or uh, project the uh, this, the table uh, with our funding levels. Okay. Oh, you've got it. Great. Chair, Chair Rowe, Commissioners, uh, for the record, Tom Reel, Director of Operations for HEC. And what I'm sharing the screen, I'm here today to summarize the, the budget for you, including the 1% general fund. And what I'm showing on the screen has our, is divided by offices and under each office is all the major programs for those offices. The first column we come to is the legislatively approved budget. This includes everything from the 2023 session, 2024 session, and any e-board action up through the early parts of 2024. 
Uh, it has the dollar amounts and our staffing levels. We go through a formulaic process to get the CSL. There's some back and forth between us and the chief financial office and the, and, uh, the legislative fiscal office. Um, and when then we get to the heart of our budget, our ask is our policy option packages. And I'm gonna go through the major dollar amount changes. Uh, this first one is from a policy option package, mostly having to do with our IT modernization project. Although you'll see the number here says $10.4 million. It's a really, it's a $5 million ask for new bond funding so we could complete phase three of the project. The additional 5 million is for a bond that's already sold and we just need the ability to spend it. We need limitation authority to spend it. Um, this also comes with some positions we're asking for as if you recall the IT modernization project was put on an eight, eight month hold and we had to review our processes and policies and staffing levels. And one of the recommendations from, from EIS or Enterprise Information Office is was to increase some staffing. So we have asked for that. Some of the one of the staffing falls into research and data office. It's a research and data man, it's a data manager. And so that goes into our ask. Going down the list, our workforce investment, we have a $62 million ask, but this is this isn't other funds. Again, this is from ARPA dollars that are coming to us through the Department of Admin Services. Um, it doesn't affect our general fund ask. And so we that is to continue the grants that we are giving out and the work we are doing for the future ready initiative. And going down the list, we have a $33 million ask through the student, OSAC Student Access and Completion. The majority of this is for the Oregon Opportunity Grant. Um, I'm coming down to a negative number. I just need to explain it. It's, it's a technical adjustment. It was a federal grant that was in our budget that we did not receive. And so we had to take it out so the numbers matched up. Uh, Early Learning Professional is a new, um, it's a grant program that's been on our books, that has been part of it, but this is the first time we are getting funding for, or we are proposing to get funding for it. And the Educator Administrator Scholarship used to be administered by the Teachers Standards and Practice Agency Commission. And we are now taking, looking to uh, take administration of that. Below is all the support to the universities and the community colleges. And most of our ask is in public university and community college construction. These are other funds ask because they come through the bonding process. Um, I'm gonna go down to the next page because it has, this is our general fund. This, it's the same chart only uh, only dealing with general fund. And you can see at the bottom, we have our $31 mil million dollar limitation here. And the, the last page is our agency request budget, the proposed budget by funding type. So you can see how we're funded as a total agency. We have a total of seven policy option packages. And if you recall prior bienniums, we usually have a lot more and they're a lot more aspirational. The way the state had gave us the process to do, we, we, we had to limit it. We have an IT modernization project. This is, we're in phase two now. We hope to complete phase two mostly in this biennium and then go on to phase three next biennium. Early learning professional grant. This is one that we have, have had on our books and we are now getting, hopefully we'll get funding for it. Future Ready Oregon. We already talked about ARPA dollars from that, from the federal government through DAS. The majority of our general fund ask is we're asking to increase the Oregon Opportunity Grant so that we necessary so we can limit the number of eligible students not able to receive awards. We have our Educator Administrator Scholarship Program. This is the one that was formally administered by the Teacher Standards and Practice Commission. And the next two policy option packages are a series of capital projects, some for public university and some for community college capital. And I hope that- Let's, 
yeah, oh, let's yes, uh, let's take a pause here and um, see if there are questions about what's in the agency request budget recommendation before we turn to um, what's not in the agency request budget recommendation and, and the proposed draft letter. Commissioners, any questions at this point? Okay. I have one question. Uh, yes. Commissioner Bisco. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you. I um, don't have you on my screen. Thank you. Well, that's Please. okay. Um, I was curious, just like with all the testimony that we've had from both staff and students that are struggling with the idea of the proposed budget, is there any way to reevaluate uh, within that 1% constraint um, and shifting more support towards the universities and the community colleges by any chance? Yeah, I'm happy to I'm happy to address that. Um, it is the commission's um, decision uh, how to sort of prioritize um, or how to spend um, dollars within that uh, one percent limitation or within that thirty one million dollars. Um, we uh, the commission. I will say though that the the commission and commission staff have worked closely with the chief financial office and the governor's staff over the past couple of months and through the subcommittee meetings and the commission meeting in June to develop this particular list and approach. Um, and while again, this commission has the authority today to do whatever it chooses to do, it would be challenging from a technical and potentially sort of relational standpoint to make adjustments to the recommendations that are before you today and that mirror the presentation that we gave to you in June. I think what may be helpful, Commissioner Bisco, um, or one possibility is that you um, express either now or when we get to the open discussion, um, your thoughts or perspective on what uh, what you would like to see with this budget and perhaps that's something that gets incorporated into um, the letter that we are sending or otherwise reflected in how this um, presentation or how this budget recommendation is um, presented thank you ben madam chair yes commission a very specific question actually to um, on the uh, just to remind me and the rest of the commission, uh, what is the substantial reduction in the Aspire program? Commissioner Devlin, Chair Rowe, the Aspire program has been for the last two bienniums been uh, funded with five million dollars for some part for four million to go to partners and a million dollars to go into the uh, Aspire program. That funding has been, was always, has been one time. And we were not able to ask for it in our policy option packages. Thank you. Anything else? Commissioner Devlin, um, I'd just add to that, that, um, we anticipate looking for other ways. Those those programs that help that transition um, are essential, and if anything, should be built up, not trimmed. Um, and we think it's a essential part of our work. So um, we are hoping that there is a way to fill that. I um, concur, Madam Chair, I concur with you, particularly given. Uh, our current data showing that uh, um, we are not having enough uh, Oregon students transition into post-secondary education. No, that's true. Those programs work. We we need to um, help find a way to do that. Um, Commissioner Smith. Thank you. I um, I'm going to ask a question. I hope it hasn't already been answered in some way. Um, so forgive me as I'm new to this process. But these policy options are relatively correct me if i'm wrong are they relatively static given obviously the one percent you know um constraint that we have if 
through this iterative process, the legislature, you know, finds more money and they say, you know, oh, you can actually have, you know, 5% over, could those policy options then be revisited? And are there other packages that are kind of ready to insert in case money is found? Or are these the policy options we're submitting? If more money is found, that money would just go to bolster um, the, the budget items? Uh, or how does that iterative process yeah. work? Commissioner Smith, it's such a good question, and thank you for asking. Um, it would be very normal um, and customary for the legislature in its budget work to establish new or to create new policy option packages that reflect where its priorities for new investment. So it is not at all limited to the list that we present. Um, and in fact, it would be very unusual if they were to sort of constrain their um, new spending to the options that we or the governor have presented to them. So no, this this they are not at all um, limited by these recommendations or the recommendations that the governor puts in her budget for policy option packages. Madam Chair. Um, if we can, um, is it OK with commissioners if we go on and have been finished the presentation yeah. and the letter that's attaching to the budget and then we can have a more full-throated discussion, if that's okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so um, the chair has included within your packet a draft letter to the governor from the commission under her signature that expresses um, on behalf of the commission some of the uh, impacts associated with an agency request budget that is um, constrained to this 1% increase. Um, and some of the concerns that the commission has about those impacts and uh, what it would mean for um, Oregonians. I'm not going to, obviously, I'm not going to read this um, four page letter. You've had it for a few days. Hopefully, you've had an opportunity to uh, review it. It is uh, really divided into three parts. Um, the first addressing the, uh, the concerns that you have expressed at prior meetings and that you heard this morning from students and representatives of colleges and universities about the current service level funding for the community college and public university support funds. So again, the staff recommendations here um, do not dedicate any policy option package or new funding above current service level to the CCSF or the PUSF. Those are um, in in the ARB recommendation at 854.7 and uh, 1 billion and 68.8 million for those respective support funds. And as we've discussed and as we've heard from partner testimony, that current service level determination falls short, well short of what we and the colleges and universities estimate would be required in terms of state investment in order to avoid a continuing cost shift to students and maintain programs and services for students. And that's uh, detailed in the first section of the letter. Um, we estimate um, currently that about $54 million above CSL would be required. So that keep in mind that that number alone would um, nearly double the uh, limit that the governor has placed on us for total new requests. But that would be a $54 million above CSL um, amount just to maintain what we believe is the actual current service level. And as um, some of you, uh, particularly on the Funding and Achievement Subcommittee, have kind of dug into the reasons why the state's estimate of current service level um, does not equal the college and university or HECS estimate of current service level. And that's uh, some of those factors are alluded to in the letter. We also describe in the second section of this letter, um, the chair has noted ways in which the um, agency request budget recommendation um, in spite of the fact that it dedicates 24.7 of that roughly 31 million allowable to the Oregon Opportunity Grant, nevertheless fails to keep up with the student need um, that uh, we, we know exists, a need that's been uh, uh, recently sort of reevaluated and has grown larger as a result of the U.S. Department of Education's new formula for assessing student need. Um, as FAFSA's uh, via the FAFSA. Uh, so the letter notes that we believe at least $150 million in new funding for the Oregon Opportunity Grant above current service level, not just the 25 million that's included in this recommendation would be required to create affordable access for low and middle income students 
We'll learn more from um, Amy Cox, or you'll learn more from Amy Cox later uh, today about our kind of approach to estimating affordability and what that would have required in prior years in order to close that gap. But that's sort of the basis for these estimates um, going forward. That section of the letter also notes the impacts that the agency request budget would have on uh, programs that uh, Commissioner Devlin alluded to uh, a, a minute ago, including Aspire, but also the four community based um, organizations that we support through a post secondary access fund that is not funded within the current service level budget and that we have not put uh, funded via a policy option package. Finally, and it's uh, last but really not least, uh, the current the the agency request budget as it's described in your packets and as Tom described would have very significant implications for workforce development initiatives in Oregon. Most notably, the recently developed and largely HEC administered Future Ready Oregon investment of nearly $200 million in total, much of which came from federal ARPA funding, would be uh, partially discontinued under the agency request budget. Um, some of the general funding components of Future Ready Oregon were built into the current service level budget and would be sustained, but the largest funding program, a grant program called Workforce Readiness Grants that are supporting community organizations and um, education and training institutions to meet workforce needs in manufacturing, healthcare, and technology um, would not be funded in the current service level budget. This is confusing because you see on that all funds page that Tom described, you see the 60 million, but that's really a reauthorization of continuing of, of, of funding that we expect to have fully allocated this biennium and we'll continue to pay it out to grantees next biennium. But under the agency request budget, we would not make new grants under a workforce readiness uh, grant program in the new biennium and much of the sort of systems change and new populations that we're reaching through those, uh, that expansive grant making program would end. Uh, likewise, a, an agency request budget would uh, end the general fund investment in prosperity programs that are administered by local workforce boards also under the um, Future Ready Oregon banner. Um, finally, as it relates to workforce development, uh, another recently established state program, the Oregon Conservation Corps, which employs young adult Oregonians in fuel reductions work in forests around the state um, in order to reduce wildfire risk and help train Oregonians for that career. Um, would end under this budget that has been funded again using one time dollars in the prior biennia and therefore is not contained um, in this agency request budget. Um, so that uh, is the sort of gist of the letter I uh, identifying those concerns um, highlighting those impacts. They're certainly not the only ones associated with this budget, but they are um, reflective of some of the I think largest concerns that the commission has expressed. Um, and that our partners have helped to uh, identify over the last several months. Um, with that, I think we're done, Madam Chair. Of course, we'll stay on for this conversation, but uh, really look forward to the Commission's consideration of this item. Only thing I'll note, um, and we can come back to this when you get hopefully towards a vote, it really is um, important that the Commission move forward an agency request budget today. I recognize that this is a difficult action item given the constraints that have been put on you. It is a statutory requirement that the agency present to the governor by the end of August an agency request budget. Assuming you adopt this budget recommendation today with these funding levels, staff will um, continue the work of preparing the narrative and the many, many pages of worksheets that accompany it, but it will follow the funding levels that are in your packet. So the chair will see and sign off on that sort of final thousand some page document that gets submitted to uh, the chief financial office and the governor at the end of August. You're voting, I hope, today on the funding levels that meet the governor's requirements, uh, have received her and her staff's, uh, have been worked out with her and her staff and received uh, their um, approval at this point. And then, of course, taking up consideration of uh, a letter or, or, uh, to accompany it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, one 
thing about the letter before we um, dive into discussion and questions. Um, as the letter indicates in the conclusion, what and what you know, commissioners, but others on the meeting call may not know, is sort of this inherent tension between having to meet the guidance of the governor, who of course has given it, um, considering the anticipated revenue levels. Um, so it's not out of whole cloth. It's that um, that's where the revenue level um, indication is so far. And then the statutory um, mandate we have really to fulfill our the priorities we have set in our strategic plan. And because this budget is so limited or because what we're proposing is so limited, those are intention. And I want to thank Ben, not just for um, the heavy lift on this letter, but staying in close touch. And this is really important with the governor's office, um, letting them know all along through the early days of this process, the concerns that you are already expressing and that you have and um, keeping the communication open there. Again, what it, also because we have, even in this letter, um, we've listed so many things that need more funding. Um, we will be prepared if the governor says, okay, we can give it this much more um, at some point if the, um, if the revenue predictions change or if she finds money elsewhere and um, pays attention to our, our plea here, we will be ready to prioritize some of these. We will be ready to say, okay, if we can only do so much, then this is what we think is most critical. So as Ben said, this is, while this is a really difficult ask for us, um, for me to ask you to pass this proposal, this is not the end of the process. And I can assure you that um, with Greg Heyman and with Ben and with Ben senior staff um, and with the governor's office, cooperation and full knowledge of what we are doing, we are pushing and will continue to as hard as we can to get this budget increased. And I'm usually a glass half full person, but you know, it could be worse. We could be looking at a 5% cut and there've been years when we've had to look at, at cuts. So anyway, this is not a done deal. So please um, tell us what questions you have and what concerns you want to express. Madam Chair. Uh, um, let me go. I'm sorry. I cut off before I cut off you last time. I cut off um, Commissioner Sapelli. So I'm going to him first, and then you, Commissioner Devlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think it's interesting because I got to meet with a couple of stakeholders and a few students, and it's obvious that the proposed budget doesn't sustain current levels of student services at the colleges and university much less address the growing burden on students facing regular tuition hikes due to the state's funding shortfalls. I'm, I'm happy with the fact that we're sending the letter to the governor to express our concerns about these funding levels, but I hope that the final budget that the legislature will pass will more effectively meet the needs of both the students and the staff. And so I'm an optimistic person. I hope it's gonna get better. But if it means that we have to have lunch with the governor, I'm totally down to do so to advocate for the students. Um, and then I did have a question. Do you know if the funding for the Built Exito program is included in the ARB? I know it's like a very specific question, but I was just curious. I'm happy to answer that question, Commissioner Sapelli. No, the the Build Exodo, that program at, at PSU was um, funded, has been funded for the last two biennia out of that sort of post-secondary access $5 million one-time appropriation that is not contained in the current service level. And that's why we, or the ARB, which is why we note that in the letter, it is one of, it's called out specifically as one of the points of concern. Um, thank you, Commissioner Sapelli. Um, okay, Commissioner Devlin, and then Commissioner Martinez after that. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If you'll indulge me for just a couple of minutes. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, thank staff and to thank you and the Vice Chair um, for listening to um, all of the issues that have come forward from the Commission, and particularly in the f &A meeting there. Uh, after the FNA meeting, I asked for a specific meeting 
uh, with uh, HEC uh, fiscal staff and with the DAS uh, CFO analyst uh, that prepared the CSL budget uh, for HEC. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the, DAS CS, the DAS CFO analyst declined to participate. And at that meeting, uh, the vice chair attended and uh, as did Ben and, uh, and the fiscal staff. And what we continued is the discussion that we had at the FNA meeting uh, that the actual CSL that's being produced by DAS uh, CFO doesn't in any way accurately reflect the actual underlying costs. Uh, that's largely because the, the whole uh, process and the whole methodology for producing that CSL uh, is not based on any real analysis of costs. Uh, it, it limits uh, by artificial uh, means in terms of limiting the increased costs in personnel and increasing and the cost uh, of underlying operating costs by just simply arbitrary limits, not by any analysis. Those arbitrary limits make up 77% of those costs for universities and 72% uh, for community colleges. Therefore, the CSL is far away from even keeping up current, current service level. Uh, I understand fully what the governor has asked for is to put forward a CSL budget, the DAS produced CSL budget, along with uh, only a 1% increase in that. And I should note for the record that the DAS CSL budget does have an increase in it, and it's not 1%. It's about 7% for the universities and 7.4% for community colleges. Actually, in both cases, clearly inadequate. Uh, the biggest problem being on the personnel side. In DAS's own personnel guidance, uh, or its guidance from DAS uh, to agencies, it indicates that the anticipate the cost for increases in base personnel costs, uh, compensation, direct compensation to be 14.5% for state employees, uh, and then at the same time says that for non-state employees, it should be 6.8%. Uh, there are about 50,000 state employees, 47,000 FTE. There are 29,000 university and community college uh, employees, about 22,000 FTE, 21, 22,000 FTE. It's no small matter. All of them are facing, and so all public entities are facing issues with bargaining and issues with the significant amount of inflation that occurred over a three year period, over seven, 17 or 18 percent. Uh, so clearly the 6.8 percent is not adequate. Um, if we were to actually send forward this budget, um, if we were to forward this budget without the letter, I wouldn't be voting for it uh, because it's clearly a very inadequate budget. Probably it's more inadequate even in some ways than some of the budgets we had to cut during the last uh, Great Recession. Uh, I think it it would be a disaster to actually for this budget to actually end up being the final budget approved by the legislature. And I am somewhat confident that the governor will not forward uh, this agency recommended budget and will make an effort to improve it. And I'm hoping that the legislature does the same. Uh, obviously, we will have an opportunity to uh, speak to that. Uh, as it's going through the legislature and to advise our people that are before the legislature. Uh, I am a little bit worried because I think it's a good would be good for some time in the future uh, for the commission to get a more full sort of budget process overview so they understand a little bit more of the process and also to understand that even if we were at a, an appropriate CSL uh, that actually accounted for the costs, the fundamental problem beyond just how they calculate the cost now is because of our past history in terms of how much the state support has declined for post-secondary education. Because of that, when we, for instance, this estimate of bringing up the amount for personnel would bring it up perhaps to about $98 million for the, uh, the total CSL along with some of the other factors beyond personnel. Uh, well, that's still about the last calculation the uh, CFO and DAS makes is what has been the history 
of how much state support they provided. So they take whatever calculation they have of CSO, and there's now is probably right in the 280 million range. And they say that the state will cover 25% of that or approximately 25%. The rest will be dependent some on minor sources. This is for universities, but largely dependent on tuition and fee increases. So even if we were at a more appropriate CSL, they would still calculate that the state only has a responsibility of 25% of that cost. As long as they continue to do that, uh, we will never be able to address the affordability issue. Uh, the state merely simply needs to find some way to contribute more to the underlying cost of post-secondary education. You can't solve this problem just by financial aid. With costs increasing and largely being on the backs of students and their families, there's no way or we are gonna have a more affordable system. So I just wanted to leave it at that. Like I say, I couldn't vote for this without the letter. I very much appreciate the letter. Uh, should this budget go forward with these levels for the uh, for the public university support fund and the community college support fund, it would be an unmitigated disaster for post-secondary education in the state. Thank you, Commissioner Devlin. Um, let me just um, make clear for the commissioners who haven't been involved in um, the FNA discussions and the questions about the DAS estimates. Um, those are important questions and they're, they are very pertinent. They, we have chosen not where we are, don't have the ability to address them while once they have made those predictions for this year and we are preparing the budget. So it is our, um, I think it's mentioned in the letter, at least in passing, um, it is certainly our expectation that as this budget goes through its steps and after it is completed, that as a commission, we will be able to meet with them and the chief financial officers and others that we need to meet with and revisit how their calculations are done and be able to um, state our concerns. So I'm just kind of separating that a little bit from the budget because we can't deal with both at the same time. And once they make their calculations, it's not, it's not productive for us to think we can unwind that um, that formula. But thank you, Commissioner Dublin, for continuing to raise it and for um, getting that even higher on our radar. Thank you for your comments. And I believe I said I'm going to Commissioner Martinez next and then Commissioner Smith and then Commissioner Heyman. Thank you, Chair Rowe. Um, I think I just really have comments on this. Um, I'm I'm very appreciative to everyone who worked on this budget. I think we all agree that it is completely not okay and unacceptable. However, I feel like the asks that are being made are obviously band-aids to keep our system going. And I feel like they were at least the right priorities going through for these band-aids. So I do appreciate that. Um, I, I'm happy that we are able to submit the letter as well, um, asking for more. And I just want to make sure that, you know, what if more funding does come available, what um, priority for me and what looks like is coming out in our strategic plan as well is that we really need to be looking at lowering those student costs um, and bringing more wraparound services um, for the students. We just have too many students in Oregon who are not going on to higher ed at all or are going out of state, um, which is also unacceptable. So thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner Smith. Thank you, Chair Rowe. I um, also very much appreciate this letter, and I know that it's you know it's four pages, and probably there is much more that could go into it um, to highlight you know the the importance of higher education in Oregon, um, and you know the tendrils and how many um, lives it touches, and the importance to our economy in Oregon. And I appreciate you, Commissioner Devlin, for pointing out the um, staffing estimates, um, the increases in personnel costs. Um, there always has been um, a difference between how DAS estimates their, you know, they put in the budget for their um, increases in uh, personnel costs into their budget while, you know, the higher education um, 
staff does not. And, you know, it's hard to, for universities to be competitive with, you know, um, county and, and city um, job openings that have similar responsibility levels. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of competition for good um, employees and we don't want to lose any um, any more people than we already have uh, in personnel and their in our colleges and and in workforce development. Um, one thing that I saw at the very end, I think this letter is very good and really doesn't need to change. Um, there was one uh, line at the very end. Um, we hope that this letter has helped illustrate how the HEX budget could come come more closely into alignment with state goals and the HEC strategic plan. And, you know, throughout the letter, you're pointing at that tension that you already talked about between the goals of the governor um, and, and probably the legislature um, of, you know, of increasing um, our higher people with higher education, um, but yet not funding it. Uh, but what I've been hearing um, throughout the testimony today is another goal of the state um, is to reduce homelessness um, and, you know, some harm reduction, um, you know, re addiction recovery and things like that. And I, I thought it was really compelling that multiple people spoke about how um, higher education has a huge part to play in those other goals, state goals. And I wonder if making that that connection very clear, maybe, uh, maybe it's too much <laughs> fifth page for the letter, um, but just adding in that, you know, we recognize that the state has, you know, a no. big, a lot on their plate, but this is a way of um, helping with those other goals. Oh, Thank you. Thank you for raising that, Commissioner Smith. It is both a way of helping with those goals um, and of building the economic prosperity um, that is the Prim a primary goal of state government. So we'll we'll consider that if as we right before we send it off. Um, Commissioner Heyman and then Commissioner Semnit. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Rowe. I just wanted to add to Commissioner Devlin's comments uh, as a commissioner and as uh, the chair of the uh, uh, Finance and Achievement uh, Committee. I I too have interests and concerns about the way in which the uh, CSL is calculated by DAS, and I uh, I look forward to uh, pursuing that matter uh, with DAS, uh, as, certainly as we prepare for the development of future budgets. I think it's a critical issue, and I certainly intend to uh, add my energy to that work. So I just want to make, add that to uh, Commissioner Devlin's comments. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Heyman. Commissioner Semnet and then um, Commissioner Coker. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Chair Rowe. Uh, I'll keep my comments brief and they just are comments. Uh, I wanted to uh, echo the appreciation for the letter uh, that uh, we've heard from my fellow commissioners. Uh, I especially appreciate how uh, it has captured uh, what um, I have have experienced as the commission's concerns and discussions that we've had uh, in the past several months as we've started and, and as we started to talk about this very difficult budget situation. Uh, I wanted to express appreciation for the process and really I really hope that the stakeholders and, and state leaders under uh, can see um, and get uh, the transparent can see the process and uh, uh, how we have come to this point where we are recommending a budget that we very much feel uncomfortable with, um, but that we have a process to uh, through the letter and through our discussion to to indicate um, our our um, of grave concerns about uh, what uh, this amount this level of funding would do for uh, uh, the po the future of post secondary education and in fact the future of uh, economic development and prosperity in this in, a, in our state um, so I'll, I'll I'll end end with that uh, just to, again to say um, and to uh, echo what Commissioner Devlin said I could not vote for uh, this budget without the letter uh, so again I really appreciate that we're able to um, have that uh, go with our our uh, go alongside the budget. Thank you. 
Commissioner Coker. Yeah, thank you, Chair Rowe. Um, I just want to echo again the, the um, thankfulness for the letter, especially the um, attention paid to the workforce development aspect of things, working with and in local government. The workforce development angle of things has been one of the things that has come up the most in the past few years that Oregon has been struggling with. There are constantly jobs in the state that are struggling to be filled, that we are struggling to find qualified folks for. And ever since the funding systems for higher education have been cut since the 08 financial crisis. Oregon has been relying on young people moving into the state from other states to fill these positions. And the dearth of funding in our higher education system has been reliant on pulling those young folks and those college educated uh, workers from other states. For the first time in um, decades, the past few years, we've seen a stagnation and even a decrease in many parts of the population in Oregon. And it's become clear that the decades of disinvestment that we have had in our higher education system are going to come back to bite us. Uh, we have not invested in our workforce. We have been relying on pulling workforce from other states, and we are going to be reaping those rewards uh, in the near future. Um, I do appreciate all the work that went into the formation of this budget, but I agree that we must tell the legislature and the governor that if we are going to solve this state's workforce development crisis in behavioral health and um, in the medical field and in so many other fields that we need to put real investment into our higher education system and that this budget is simply not enough. Uh, I also want to express my appreciation for all of these student representatives who came in today. Uh, I know how difficult it is and intimidating it is for a um, student to come in and testify in front of these boards. Uh, and I want to send my appreciation for all the students who took the time, effort, and energy to um, talk about their relationship with the budget and how it would have real impacts on their lives and the lives of their fellow students. Thank you for that, Commissioner Coker. Anyone else or any questions that Ben could answer for us. I really appreciate all of you coming to this with um, as um, as sorrowful as we are about it and as inadequate as we clearly believe it is. But seeing the process and um, having confidence in the staff, knowing what all has gone into it and the difficult decisions um, and sort of just allowing us the ability to go forward with this. And again, thank you, Ben, for um, your leadership of the commission and the staff and your help and guidance to us and your communication, positive communications with the governor's office. So with that, um, I will ask for a very difficult vote and ask for a motion to approve the ARB and send it to the governor as we are um, required to do before the end of this month. Um, and that also is pending any minor changes we might make to the letter. Well, I move that we approve the budget and the I letter. I know someone has to. Thank you very much, Commissioner Yamasaki. Madam Chair. Yes, Commissioner Devlin. Madam Chair, uh, I would uh, ask, I know this is going to be done anyway, but I would ask the, as a friendly amendment that along with the uh, agency recommended budget that the letter from the uh, from you uh, representing uh, the HEX position on the budget that we're submitting be submitted to the governor with that recommended budget that she has requested and that should the agency uh, publish in any way or put online our agency request budget that the letter be included in uh, anything that's put online. Uh, thank thing. you. Thank you, Commissioner Devlin. The letter is going to the governor um, with the budget and um, this is a public meeting and so it is a, a public letter and will be included as appropriate in any um, anything else we do, but it is already, it is a public letter as of this meeting mm -hmm. and it will be included to the governor. So um, Commissioner Yamasaki, um, 
Are you still comfortable with a motion to approve? Yes, I am. Given that. Okay, and I need a second, please. I'll second. second. Thank you both very much. I know it's not an easy motion or second. Um, all those in favor, indicate by raising your hand, please. Aye. Aye. We're saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. One opposed as I see it. Do you see any different Guthrie's or anybody I'm not seeing? I show one opposed, Commissioner Coker. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, motion passes. Thank you very much, staff and commissioners. Okay, take a deep breath, everybody. Um, we will keep you informed, obviously, of the process on that. We have one more item before um, lunch, and it's the... It's another big one in terms of our interest and its importance. Um, Dr. Amy Cox is here to talk about the tuition equity report and walk us through it and the drivers of college affordability. Welcome, Amy. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rowe. Um, good morning, Chair Rowe, Vice Chair Heyman, and members of the commission. Um, I drew the short straw to follow the budget discussion, um, but hopefully this will um, Today's presentations will provide you some hope of some of the programs you have supported. Um, for the record, my name is Amy Cox and I'm the Director of the Office of Research and Data at the HEC. The Office of Research and Data has two items in front of you today, a legislative report um, and an informational item about affordability as mentioned. Uh, both of these items are the work of a whole team of people in my office, our office. Um, so I'm representing all of them here and I'm grateful to them. Item 7.1 is a legislative report with a very long title that I will spare you. This report is um, describes the impact on students and on the public universities of three programs that enable certain groups of students to attend one of the public universities at reduced tuition rates. The first program um, as referenced is called tuition equity. You may remember this from past years. It allows students who spent part of their childhood in Oregon and graduated from an Oregon high school, but who are not US citizens, um, for example, DACA students, uh, to attend a public university at in-state tuition rates. In 2021, the legislature added three additional groups of non-citizens to become eligible for this program. Uh, those three groups are federally recognized refugees, special immigrant visa holders, and members of the compacts of free association countries. Because U.S. citizenship is a requirement of Oregon residency at the institutions for the purposes of tuition, this statute allows these students to attend at in-state rates. The tuition equity program also allows some veterans to attend a public university at in-state rates who otherwise would not meet the residency requirements. And those are veterans who graduated from an Oregon high school, left Oregon for military service, and then returned to Oregon after they left the armed forces. But because they haven't lived in Oregon for um, a consistent or a the certain number of years prior to enrollment, they wouldn't be eligible for in-state rates. Um, I'm now actually going to share my screen because it's going to get a little more complicated. Um, this figure from the report um, shows the relationship between the tuition equity program and green and two very related statutes uh, shown in shades of blue. Um, the second program, the Non-Resident non Veteran and Dependent Fee Remission Program, also allows veterans who are newly back in Oregon to attend public university at in-state rates. This program predates tuition equity, um, and uh, we were not aware of it, to be frank and honest with you. Um, and the eligibility is very similar to that for tuition equity. Um, it's slightly different, but the reality is that most Oregon veterans are eligible for either program. And for this reason, we can only really get an accurate number of veterans who are benefiting 
from these tuition remission programs if we look at them together, because some might be in one and some might be in another. Um, and now um, this second program, the non-resident veteran and dependent fee remission also allows dependents of those same veterans to attend a university in state rates. And the report looks at those dependents as well. Um, and then finally, at the risk of complicating things further, this second program is required by statute to be reported on in combination with a third program that provides tuition benefits. And this third program, the Veteran Qualified Dependent Waiver Program, uh, waives tuition entirely, tuition and fees, I should say, entirely for resident spouses and children of Purple Heart recipients, of veterans who are 100% disabled from their service, um, and, uh, and spouses and children of veterans who died from their service. Now the report walks through all three of these programs separately and in combination and details the number of students who receive the benefits and what the financial impacts are for students and for the universities. Um, together, the programs served more than 1,500 students in 2022-23, a total that has grown over the last decade. Uh, veterans account for about half of this total and their numbers have risen in the last, really steadily over the last decade. The number of non-citizens from high schools, so think DACA students, um, who receive tuition benefits has been declining since the pandemic. So that is an unfortunate finding to report to you. It is consistent with the decline in college going rates that we have seen since the pandemic. Um, the number of non-citizens in those newly eligible groups um, has shown up and increased uh, for the number of compact of free association islanders and the number of special immigrant visa holders, um, totaling about 70. Uh, there were no federally recognized refugees participating in the programs as of yet. Um, and then the number of non-resident dependent veterans, so these are dependents of veterans who wouldn't have in-state tuition, is small, but the number of dependents of, of veterans who are Purple Heart recipients um, or who died from their service or who are 100% disabled has risen quite steadily. Financially, the programs have large impacts for students and their families, uh, more than $20,000 a year for a full-time student who would be paying in-state tuition instead of out-of-state tuition, uh, and more than $9,000 a year for a student who, um, whose in-state tuition would be waived entirely. The impacts on the universities are also potentially quite large. Uh, these impacts are a little complicated to try to dissect because we don't know whether students enrolled simply because, precisely because these programs provide a benefit or whether they would have enrolled regardless of the benefit. Um, if the students had enrolled only because of the benefits of these programs, then we can estimate that the universities received an increase in tuition revenue of up to $11 million in 2022-23. Um, however, if all of the students would have enrolled anyway, uh, regardless of these tuition benefits, then the universities would have paid a cost of up about twice that, $22 million in 2022-23. Um, with that, I'm going to stop screen sharing and um, ask if there are questions. Misters, any questions? Um, this is an action item for this report. Madam Chair, I move to approve the report. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes, and thank you very much, Amy, for that presentation and for the work you and your staff did on the report. You are so welcome. Um, are we ready to move on to 7.2?
Yes, we are. Okay, thank you. Um, this item, as mentioned, is informational. Uh, it stems from discussion and questions about affordability that came up during a finance and achievement subcommittee meeting this past spring. Uh, the goal of today's presentation is really to provide you with a better understanding of how we as an agency are able to measure affordability among college and university students and what has contributed to greater or lesser affordability for different groups. I want to make, um, before I start to share slides, uh, one other comment before going further, and that is what I will show you, as is often the case, is based on administrative data. Uh, and I hope that, in particular, student records and financial aid records. Um, and while I hope that the way we've put these data together will be very helpful for you, uh, I do not want to pretend that they paint the whole picture of affordability. <laughs> they very much do not. Um, uh, students and families face very real and difficult challenges that uh, administrative data cannot present. Um, and while I find them helpful, I am particularly grateful for um, the testimony earlier this morning of so many students who can give you um, uh, a more rounded, well-rounded picture uh, than these slides alone would be able to do. So with that, I'm going to uh, share slides. Let's see. Um, I've already said some of this around affordability, but I do want to point out on this slide um, <clears throat> the group for whom we can measure affordability. So what students were actually talking about. It is not every student. It is not every post-secondary um, education and training participant or student in the state. It is the students for whom we have financial records. And those are students at the community colleges and public universities who applied for financial aid. Um, we restrict it to Oregon students, Oregon residents, because we do not know um, out-of-state aid. Right. So the students for whom we have the most complete picture, I won't claim it's complete, but it's the most complete picture are Oregon residents at community colleges and public universities, undergraduates who have applied for financial aid. I'm going to talk today about how we measure affordability, uh, how the costs and resources that contribute to that measure have changed over the last decade or two uh, and what it all means. Please do feel free to interrupt me. Um, it's I can't always see a hand raised while I'm presenting. Um, with, this is the definition that we use for affordability. It is similar to definitions uh, created in other states. There is not a national standard to, of how to measure affordability. Um, and in essence, what we do is we compare the cost of attendance that institutions publish and have to publish for federal reporting. Um, with the resources that students bring to the table. Um, the cost of attendance includes tuition and fees, housing, books and supplies, transportation, and personal expenses. And the resources, which I've called here expected resources, and I'll explain what I mean by expected in just a moment, um, includes financial aid grants, um, the expected family contribution uh, from the FAFSA uh, or ORSA, the institutional aid, um, and estimates of earnings, of student earnings. Um, <clears throat> we uh, draw these data for every single person uh, that we have data on, and we compare the two. So these are individually defined um, affordabilities and then that are tallied up across all of the students. We prorate it if the students are attending part-time uh, such that their cost of attendance would be less uh, and their um, uh, financial aid grants, we count the actual dollars of those. So um, those are sort of automatically prorated. The measure, um, as I've said, uses the best available data that we have, but it is not everything. Um, we only have the data for students who apply for financial aid. Uh, students may have, for example, lower housing costs because they live with their parents, uh, or they may not be able to afford the expected family contribution. So it is not perfect, but it is, um, I would say, good. Uh, the data in the presentation look backward, so this is going to talk about the expected family contribution, not about the new student aid index. That's work in front of us to calculate. 
Um, a question I often get answered is where do loans fit in? Commissioner Heyman, Vice Chair Heyman. Just a quick question. If there is any uh, calculated unmet need, does that equate to unaffordability or is there some degree to which you have to have unmet need to uh, achieve that metric? Vice Chair Heyman, thank you. That is a really great question, and I apologize for not explaining it. Um, any unmet need um, is considered unaffordability in this measure. So students who have any unmet need, we include in the unaffordable group. If thank their you. costs outweigh their resources by $1 or by $10,000, we call, put them in the unaffordable group. Thank you. Um, I'm often asked where loans fit in. Uh, the reality is that these are expected costs and expected resources. Um, they are the published cost of attendance. They're not necessarily students' actual costs. Students may have um, childcare costs that are not incorporated, which can be significant. They may have fewer resources than, um, than uh, we expect. Uh, and loans, loans fill the gap. That's where loans fit in. Uh, the EFC uh, is something that I'd like to call particular attention to. This is um, uh, expected uh, family contribution that is calculated by the federal government through a particular formula. Um, and <clears throat> it is something that um, can be significantly high for middle and upper income families. Uh, the example here that I've given you is that a family with a household of with a household income of $150,000 and countable assets of $100,000 had an EFC of almost $34,000. So the ex expectation is that that family has saved or can afford $34,000 per year uh, for um, uh, a student uh, to, to attend college and university. Um, there is... Um, certainly a lot of anecdotal evidence that many families cannot afford that. Um, although I do not have uh, quantitative evidence to tell you what percentage that would be. Um, the calculation for the student aid index going forward is somewhat different, but this um, phenomenon, it's not different radically such that this um, uh, large amount of expected family contribution um, moving forward called student aid index we expect would continue. Commissioner Martinez. Yes, thank you. I'm wondering if looking at the um, family contribution, if we if there's any way at looking at the data of those who supposedly have that, but yet are having to take out the parent loans, if that would help with that number? We do. We have loan data for university students, federally subsidized loan data for future for university students, but not for community college students. And so I don't have complete loan data to be able to look at that question. But actually, that is something that we are hoping to do going forward to try and answer exactly the question you raised. Um, absolutely, yes. Um, in 2022-23, this is the result of that whole calculation, costs outweighed resources for 36% of the students. So in other words, an estimated 36% of students shown here in red um, had costs that outweighed their expected resources. Um, and the remaining 63% of students had expected resources that would cover that published cost of attendance. Um, those costs, this is it on um, average uh, for these students, those costs break out into the groups uh, that I referenced earlier. About half of it is room and board or housing costs. Um, a little over a third of it is tuition and fees. Um, and the remaining groups, books and supplies, transportation, and personal expenses. This is an average across all of the students that we have financially data for. Um, and those these costs can differ um, some, uh, which I'll get to in a moment for different students. Uh, the resources, again, this is an average. The resources uh, are expected family contribution. That's the darkest blue on the bottom, covering half um, of the um, of the of the combined resources. Uh, student earnings covering almost a third. 
Um, and then various forms of public aid and institutional aid uh, covering the remaining portions. So again, this is students um, all averaged together. Um, the resources in particular, that distribution of what resources contribute to the, to the sort of pile of, of cash, if you will, to help pay for, for college and university um, can vary very, can vary significantly by students' income background. So here are the costs for lower income students um, on the left and for students who are from middle or upper income families are on the right. The costs are pretty similar, but the resources are widely similar, widely different, excuse me. Um, on the left, students from lower income backgrounds, and you see that their expected family contribution is much smaller. Um, and therefore, their earnings um, and their public grant aid and institutional aid are what is covering the bulk of their cost of attendance, um, if they can cover that cost of attendance. But that those are the resources that they are bringing um, to bear um, their own earnings and uh, public aid. Uh, the students from middle and upper income backgrounds um, here, almost the entire cost of attendance is expected to be covered by the expected family contribution and student earnings, 94%. So quick question, this is Gail. On the lower income resources then, if I'm reading this right, that the students in terms of their own employment would be expected to pay 50% of their cost of attendance. Am I reading that right? I would phrase it a little differently, but you're reading that right. The way I would say it to you is that the cost of attendance um, that students have to be, the students have to pay, um, they're bringing to that, that bill essentially, um, whatever resources they have. And the resources that they have, half of the resources they have are their own earnings. Um, that, is, that is correct, about 40%, a little over 40% comes from public aid. The combination of that actually does not cover the cost of attendance for many low-income students. Okay. It's and just not you, sufficient. And when you say public aid, what is that? I mean the Pell Grant. I mean, federal and state grants. So the Pell Grant, the Oregon Opportunity Grant, the Promise Grant, and other state financial aid grants, as well as um, institutional aid, um, which is something we have data on for the university students. The universities are where the vast majority of institutional aid is offered. Um, and we count that toward that uh, pile of resources that students bring to the table also. So we add up their... Um, uh, their federal and state grants, um, the institutional aid for university students, um, an estimate of students' earnings, and what the FAFSA says their family should be able to contribute, and that's the resources that they have. And if those resources, if that total is larger than the cost of attendance, then we say they can afford the cost. Madam Chair. Um, I think Commissioner Heyman and then you, Commissioner Devlin. Uh, thanks, Chair Rowe. Uh, Amy, just a quick question. Um, I'm assuming that the that the larger numbers of those who have unmet need are represented in the lower income uh, category. I'm just wondering, your rather large uh, indication of uh, a resources through earnings estimate, I guess, is simply backfilling um, what is unmet need within the calculation and um, just seems a little, I'm not, I'm not sure how to best represent that, but but since you don't, you they paid it, we assume, um, or they dropped out. Uh, and um, so I, um, I guess I don't know how best to, re best to represent that, but it would, I mean, it's sort of a, sense that well they have a lot of them that need and we know some other resources but we don't know we know is where they got that rest of the money it just seems to fall into the earnings estimate is that a correct understanding of that column vice chair Heyman, i um 
I appreciate your question because it's one we've wrestled with in our office as well um, and in conversation with other states. Uh, the, um, the estimate of student earnings um, is something we intentionally put in here uh, because um, so many undergraduates do work um, because many undergraduates who receive a Pell Grant uh, get work study. Um, and so they are working 15 hours a week or 10 hours a week. Um, and so what we did is we intentionally built that in as part of the resources, knowing that so many undergraduates um, are employed. Uh, the reality of it is that that's not, um, that's not a problem-free inclusion, I, I guess I would say it that way. Um, you know, from my own, you know, my own experience, you know, I was on work study, you know, I worked 15 hours a week. Um, I had those earnings. Um, and uh, for middle and students from middle and upper income families where the expected or students from low income families, regardless, actually, um, if the family is ex if the family is meeting some of that expected family contribution, depending on those student earnings for some of that expected family contribution, um, then we are underestimating the, the affordability problem. Um, in other words, if, um, if those are not uh, in reality, separate resources, students earnings and the expected family contribution, um, then, then affor the affordability problem is larger than we're stating. Yeah, We've made I... the assumption that there is both an expected family contribution and a set of um, of su student earnings to contribute. Can I follow up real quick, Chair? Rowe? Yes. Um, just, so, if if I understand you correctly, um, the upper area of that column is actual information how the fifty eight percent of that cost is actually covered is estimate uh, but we don't know we don't really know where that money comes from it could be borrowed it could there are a lot of ways in which the, that column and i just want to make sure we don't lose um uh, recognition that there uh, there may be um other complications associated with where those funds came from whether Mr. it's the family borrowing, whether it's the family borrowing money or the student borrowing money or you know whatever something Vice Chair Heyman, you you are you are absolutely correct, and I apologize. Um, uh, yes, the expected family contribution is the actual expected family contribution designated on a student's FAFSA or ORSA. We do not know where those families and students have um, obtained that money from. It may have been that they've been saving it. It may have been that they're working an extra job. It may have been that they are taking out a loan. Commissioner Devlin. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. One, I know it's somewhere in the materials, but your 36% of being uh, uh, unaffordable is a combined rate between university and community college students. And the university rate is significantly higher. It's like 50%. Um, there, you've indicated there are a number of areas which I think it would actually be very difficult for you to have the data, but you only actually evaluate actual students who have filed the FAFSA, correct? You don't, there's no way to evaluate students who filed the FAFSA but never attended. And obviously even beyond that, there's no way for you to know how many students simply decided from the very beginning that they, they, they or their family could not afford for them to go to college. Um, so all of those factors are outside of this. But um, I wonder, um, I just have one little specific request, and I know it's probably based on uh, household income in the FAFSA, uh, of what are the, what is categorized as low income and what is categorized as middle and upper income? And I know it's Commission probably based on family size. Like Commissioner Devlin, such good questions. And it's actually simpler than the family size household income piece. Um, we simply use whether or not the student was um, eligible for a Pell Grant. Oh, okay. And yeah, what's the maximum for a Pell Grant now? 
It's about six thousand dollars, a little more. And where at an EFC would you no longer be eligible? I'd have to look that up. Okay. Um, I think it's about eight thousand EFC, but okay. I don't want to go on record saying that. About the same level we were trying to achieve for the opportunity grant. Then. That is correct. Yes. Okay. That is correct. Yes. Um, and uh, to just address your other comments, you are absolutely correct that students who have not both filed a FAFSA or ORSA and enrolled are not included in this calculation. And it is difficult, as many of the data estimates are for me, um, to uh, share with you what we have um, and know that it is not complete. Uh, there are many students who have not who have enrolled but not filed a FAFSA or SA um, who are who are low income. We cannot assume that they are all upper income and didn't apply for aid because um, they didn't figure they would qualify. Um, in addition, there are students who don't enroll at all because of the um, the affordability challenges that it would incur. Uh, and so those students are not included here. Um, I will thank you for, um, especially for your comment about sector differences and the differences between the colleges and universities, um, because that is actually the next slide. Um, the, <laughs> the costs are different between the colleges and the universities, and that is primarily because of tuition. Um, remember these stacked bar charts are essentially pie charts. So everything in here is the share of the cost or the share of the resources. It's not actual dollars. Um, and the because tuition is less at the colleges is lower, uh, the, the room and board costs um, are a bigger part of that pie. Um, but the dollar amount, the total dollar amount of attending a community college is lower than the total dollar amount of attending a public university. Um, the resources um, are different in a, an important way that I referred to, and that is um, the, the fact that the public universities offer a substantial amount of institutional aid to many of their students, and we do account for that in um, the formula. There are all of the results that I will go through from here forward. We have also broken out by sector, but I will not be going through that today um, in the interest of time. One last question. Um, For these areas where you don't have the data to actually do the calculation, um, either, I mean, it would require more resources for you to have, or if there's anything being done on a national level, has anybody attempted to do, you know, simply, um, well, I'll give you an example. In the census, there is a great controversy between actually counting people and actually doing. Uh, estimates based on underlying um, very complex uh, calculations. Uh, it would seem that, like in this question of how many parents are actually being able to pay the EFC, uh, that you could actually, uh, somebody could do an estimate of that based on a sampling and get some sign of an estimate. You could do the same for, um, if you contact them, uh, for, uh, you know, high school students who had graduated, um, who had never filed a FAFSA and may not be attending an Oregon school. Uh, has there been any, at a national level even, of looking at some of that data, of who should simply choosing not to attend or what families can't even come close to the EFC? Com Commissioner Devlin, this is a very good question and one that, um, that we explored. And I cannot tell you that we um, we may have missed something. Uh, certainly we may have missed something, but what I can tell you is that um, I we did not see any um, of the sort of in-depth research studies that take that draw on um, detailed financial records in which this kind of question is often posed that um, that addressed EFC. Uh, we will keep looking. Um, but we were um, in our office um, disappointed that we couldn't come, we couldn't find one and and 
offer an estimate of how many families can pay the EFC. Um, what um, or how many families don't of uh, those who don't apply for financial aid may have actually been eligible for some. Um, what I can tell you is that there are questions that we, um, in the case of the um, of how many families and students can pay the EFC, that we're actually um, hope to look at in the coming, well, as time allows, in the coming year or more. We do have data on that, at least for public university students that we would like to, to explore. Okay, we're going to um, go ahead and um... If you can save the questions from here on out to the end. Um, and we thank you, Amy, and we recognize those of us who have been on the commission for a while and know you, we recognize how terribly uncomfortable it is for you to complete data, that, present data that you know is incomplete. <laughs> we, we sympathize with that, but I know I know that's a challenge thank you. for you. And thank and you we, for your kindness. <laughs> we appreciate the value that this has, even though incomplete. So um, go ahead and let's go through it, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and it was useful to sort of answer those questions to make sure everyone's sort of on the same page for the definition. Now right. let's talk about sort of what's changed. Um, this is a trend line that shows um, uh, almost two decades of the cost of attendance for a full-time student. Uh, this is the number published by the institutions. It's the top line. The middle line is the average cost of attendance among these financial aid applicants, you'll notice it is smaller because many students attend part-time and we've down, we've prorated that cost. Um, the blue line is Oregon's public investment per student in um, colleges and universities. That includes both the college and university support funds and the state's investment in um, financial aid grants. Um, so you can see sort of how those compare this dip here um, in those years after the Great Recession, when investment um, in colleges and universities in Oregon really um, declined. This is that same cost bar chart. You saw this part here, this last line um, in an earlier slide. I've now trended them um, to show how what different drivers of these costs have um, contributed to ri the rising affordability challenge um, that students face. Um, the larger costs really are driven that, that students experience today compared to the larger costs they experienced a decade ago or more um, are really driven by the increase in tuition and fees. That's the bottom darkest brown. Um, we've put a red arrow there to demonstrate that. Um, and by the rising cost of room and board. Um, that is the housing crisis that we hear about um, outside of post-secondary education and training. This does not mean other costs have not risen. They have, uh, but they haven't risen as fast as tuition and fees and room and board. Um, tuition and fees as a, as a share of total costs went from 28% um, in 2006-07 to 36% of the total costs in 2022-23. So it's a little different way of thinking about tuition and fees. We often talk about the absolute dollar amount, um, but here what we're saying is it is, um, it is eating up um, a bigger part of the cost of going to college and university. Um, at the same time that the costs have risen, we have also seen resources rise. Um, and the resources have risen, that's shown here in the green line, the average resources among these financial aid applicants. Uh, this overall increase in resources has come from a few things. It's come from the um, increase in the minimum wage in the last several years. It has come from undoubtedly um, uh, from the increase in grant aid. Um, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, this is that same resources bar chart, as I said about the cost. Um, this last bar here on the right, you saw in an earlier slide. Um, now I've, we've shown a whole trend here, and you can see here the, um, the increase in a few things. One is the thing that probably you see more than anything is that this 
sort of middle blue bar has gotten smaller and this dark blue bar has gotten bigger. And what that means is that the expected family contribution is taking up a bigger share of the resources. Um, that is not because the calculation for EFC changed. That is not because families are expected to pay more today than they were expected to pay before. It is because we have more students in this group who do not qualify for financial aid. So we have more students from the middle and upper income backgrounds. Um, remember the students from the low income backgrounds have very small expected family contributions. And here, same chart, but now I've added this line across it, which I probably should have made a darker color. Um, this line that shows the percentage of this student group um, who were eligible for a Pell Grant. So after the Great Recession, when enrollment was highest at the universities and especially at the colleges, we had many more students in the institutions who were from low income backgrounds who were eligible for a Pell Grant. And those students were bringing um, resources to the table as well, but expected family contribution wasn't part of it because their expected family contribution is low. So um, the, the takeaway here is really that the resources that people bring to try and cover the cost of attendance depends not only on what resources are available, but what backgrounds, what the student body looks like. Um, so this is that same bar chart, but only among the low income students. And so here you see the relatively small contribution of expected family of EFC, um, the larger portion of earnings. And here in these outlined um, bars, this is the relevance of those public financial aid grants. I didn't outline all of them, just the two largest ones, the Pell Grant and the Opportunity Grant, which for students from low income backgrounds, um, are covering that public financial aid is covering 40% of those expected resources. And this is the impact of the state and the federal government in, in supplying financial aid for students. So when we put those resources that I just showed you and the costs together, then we see this trend. And this is the trend in college affordability. We want this red line to be zero, that no students face unmet need. And what we've seen is that it was quite stable for this period here. It was fell in after the Great Recession, and that's as students from low income backgrounds were less likely to be enrolled. Then it was quite stable. And then in the last several years, the number of students or the share of students who face unmet need really declined. And that's because of two things. Well, a few things, um, but mostly it's because of increased state grants and increased um, uh, institutional aid through the pandemic relief funds. Those pandemic relief funds went away um, in, um, or almost entirely went away um, in 2022-23. And so the percentage of students facing unmet need rose by one percentage point in the last year. So then the question is, so what we've seen thus far, let me just sort of recap to situate people, tuition and housing has risen the fastest, um, more students from, from middle and upper income backgrounds increases, um, the reliance on EFC to cover costs um, and similarly lowers what we can calculate as affordability or unaffordability rather. Um, and that state grants has re have really risen in the importance for um, especially for students from low income backgrounds. Um, I'm going to sort of skip this just in the interest of time. It just summarizes what we've talked about. 
um, and move into what does this mean for public policy? And one of the questions that was raised at that spring FNA meeting about what would it take for the affordability rate to be zero for at least as we've calculated it um, with its limitations, what would it take for no students to have unmet need? Um, now, the answer to that depends, as we've seen, on a number of factors. One is on simply the volume of students enrolled. If you're going to have a much larger student body, as we had several years back, you're going to need a much larger um, uh, budget ask. Um, if you're going to have students who are um, more often from lower income backgrounds, you're also going to need a larger budget ask because you are going to have more students who are relying on those um, financial aid grants. So in 2013-14, uh, when enrollment was high uh, 10 years ago, we had 64,000 students who were facing unmet need. They would have each needed a grant on average of $6,000, which would have summed up to a total cost of almost $400 million. This is on top of the $154 million that we already have budgeted annually for the Opportunity Grant. Uh, in 2019-20, uh, when enrollment had fallen, but the pandemic um, decline in enrollment wasn't in full swing, we had about 44,000 students uh, with unmet need. They would have needed a grant of about $6,500. A total annual uh, cost of that of such a program would be almost $300 million. Um, in 2022, 23, which is the year that we have, the most recent year that we have data, um, we would again um, need a grant of about 6,000, a little more than $6,000, but there's half as many students as there were 10 years ago to be covered, 31,000, um, meaning a total annual cost of about $200 million. Now, obviously any of these things could change if we had um, expanded um, FAFSA ORSA filing, um, if the percentage of students from different income backgrounds changed, um, but this is the sort of level, the magnitude of ask that would be needed. Um, if we put it all together, um, what I can tell you is that um, what you, in some ways, what you already know, the affordability challenge facing community college and public university students is high. Um, however, uh, the impacts, we see impacts on that affordability whenever tuition is lower and public aid, public grant aid is higher. Um, expanding the access to college and university for Oregonians from low income backgrounds is going to require additional resources and reducing affordability to zero is going to require significant new investment. Um, and then lastly, and you know I couldn't say get through a, 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 this presentation without saying that if we had improved data, we would be able to capture this better. Um, we are always in conversation with the colleges and universities um, to try and uh, understand and expand the data that we have available um, to us to do so. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, I'm going to jump in with the first additional question, and you may have said this and I may have missed it. On the um, family estimated family contribution or ability to contribute, um, one of the slides said it takes into account assets and after 100,000, it basically um, zeroes them out. And is, um, so if someone is a homeowner and paying a mortgage, but they have $100,000 in equity, that is, is that, counted as part of it? Um, I am not an expert, Chair Rowe, Chair on, on the asset calculation in the FAFSA. Um, I I know my colleague Juan baez Arevalo is far better versed in this than I am. What I can tell you is that the assets, there are um, what are called countable assets um, that contribute to the expected family contribution. Um, and they um, they include, uh, you know, equity in houses and that kind of thing, um, as well as, you know, adjusted gross income. Um, 
they're part of their calculation toward the EFC. Yes, they're definitely part of the EFC calculation. But what counts as accountable asset and where the ceiling is, that part I'd have to get back to you on. I mean, that sort of brings it home, if true, because you can have a family struggling to pay just an average size mortgage and still potentially have whatever they've already paid into that mortgage um, sort of count against them in terms of ability to get financial aid. So at some point, I'd like some clarity on that. It just adds to the scope of the problem. If that, we if we absolutely will we'll get back to you on what's included um, and not included. I will tell you that um, uh, you raise this sort of broader issue that the housing crisis um, and the affordability challenges in housing affect student affordability yep. in ways beyond um, the the impact on a student's housing that I've I've included here. So if families are paying a much larger portion of their income toward rent or mortgage, those are dollars that are not available to save for their children's college. Right. Um, Commissioner Devlin. Madam Chair, just a couple of clarifying. The previous slide where you said it would take this amount, um, it, is that based on getting to the 8,000 EFC and not having any of, uh, and all being affordable or the 10,000 EFC being all affordable, unaffordable? Is it not, it's not accounting for at all beyond that level of it being unaffordable? Commissioner Devlin, it's um, it's taking into account all of the the resources and ass and and costs that we've addressed thus far. So, in other words, if if every student that we have data for, if every student had resources, expected resources that covered their expected costs, then we would have affordability. Then we would be at a, at a zero affordability rate. We would have zero unmet need. Is the estimate. Um, it's not based on an EFC. It includes okay. all ESCs. Oh, okay. okay, I'll probably have to inquire further on that. And then on your last slide, last slide, uh, this bottom left-hand corner, reducing affordability to zero would require significant new investment on top of current financial aid budgets. Wouldn't you include within that an increased investment by the state in higher education, reducing the overall costs? The students and families. Um, Commissioner Devlin, if I'm understand, can I just reflect back to you to make sure I'm understanding you properly? Um, uh, you're saying um, I in the slide prior, I assumed that investment would translate to a financial aid grant, but actually yeah. it could also translate to um, and perhaps would need on top of this additional budget for the universities and colleges. Is that what you're? That's what I'm trying to say. I mean, you can account for so much with financial aid, but as long as tuition in, continues to increase at the level it's increasing, there is always probably going to be an underlying issue with affordability. Yes, you are exactly right. This assumes constant, right? Which yeah. is, um, yes, I've sort of alluded to a bit of that in this lower right box that says related factors that change could change these estimates. I didn't put in changes to tuition and, and fees. You're right. Um, I held those constant and they have not held constant, right? Um, if they continue to rise, this would probably continue. This would be a larger ask because there would be a larger um, cost to cover. Uh, also, you're exactly right. Yeah, I also point out that you know, in your average cost of attendance, you obviously averaged everything and the average cost of attendance this coming year, I believe at the U of O is, you have 26,000 is 38, about 38,000 for an undergraduate. Yes, the cost mm -hmm. of attendance is very different, um, especially when we look across every one of the 24 public institutions, it can range pretty, pretty widely. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And thank you for the questions and thank you, Amy. Any other questions? We've had a full morning, commissioners. We are going to break for lunch and come back at 12.45.
So cameras and mics off if you're on the computer.